Three, two, one. Hello, topical folk, and welcome back to your uh, weekly or bi weekly or however the heck I want to do this podcast on the NBA coverage. So uh, today we're going to be going through all the stuff that's been happening in the past week and a half since you heard our great All Star special. Uh, we'll probably get into uh, best overperformers, best underperformers, uh, best teams so far, uh, how it's changed the playoff structure. Uh, the amazingly eight teams that are uh, all fighting it out for the last place seed, and then the even fewer teams that are even trying to win at this point, and then uh, see uh, what we think on some of the most interesting uh, proposals around the NBA, stuff like uh, reform to the playoff system, because we all know that the West-East thing has its problems right now, and uh, if the draft needs to be changed at all. So, uh, Rob, what, what games have you uh, seen this week? So uh, I've been keeping some pretty close tabs on uh, Cleveland because I knew that uh, I knew that before the All Star break when they made all of their uh, their additions with the, at the trade deadline getting Rodney Hood, Jordan Clarkson, Larry Nance, and George Hill. Um, I knew that you know they would have to develop as a team and everything like that. So I've been watching most of their games. Um, I I think their first game after the deadline was against the Wizards, and well, actually they're. After the All Star break, they, they're starting off on a five game homestand. Um, so their first game, they uh, they lost to the Wizards at home, um, which I thought was fairly disappointing, seeing as uh, before the All Star break they had beaten Boston on the road and uh, Oklahoma City on the road pretty convincingly. Um, so that I thought was a little bit of a disappointment. Um, and then they beat the Grizzlies which was expected, but then they lost to San Antonio at home, uh, and then they lost uh, to another team. Can't remember who exactly. Um, and then just recently they lost to uh, they lost to Denver last night. So I've been keeping – most of my NBA attention has been on, uh, on Cleveland. Okay. And uh, they also lost to the uh, – where are they? The 76ers. So not a terrible Sixers, loss, yep. but – On know. Thursday, yeah. That's right. Yeah. And uh, the Cavs overall, I, I was going to mention this later, but they've actually uh, been the worst in the past week in terms of their ELO change. Uh, ELO, for those who don't know, is just a it's a rating system that was originally developed for chess, but it's designed to uh, uh, devolve all of your uh, your current uh, team strength uh, and uh, determine it based on your recent performance uh, weight, weighted most and then your uh, past game performance, and that's it. It doesn't look at injuries, it doesn't look at your uh, future schedule, it doesn't look at, oh, they've got a bunch of games coming up on the road, it just looks at how you did in your past couple games and the point differential. So, yeah, the Cavs at a negative 49 have been the worst team in the past week, so that's not boding well for their uh, trading all of their assets, but I guess it's all about how they do in the playoffs at this point. Cleveland is an interesting situation to me because, I mean, well, obviously they're always an interesting situation because LeBron James is always a, he's a very big talking point every year. But I think this year specifically is, I mean, obviously there's all the, all the debate around where he's going to go next season if he opts out of his, uh, his contract and everything. Like, I mean, the, the main thing that's disappointing to me is that when I watch them, like I love watching Cleveland simply because I love watching LeBron James. And it's always interesting to see, you know, how he plays because he, he typically plays pretty well. And, um, it's just when when you watch them play, it just it doesn't seem like they have any sort of sync defensively. And then you know, I really I was watching the the game against Denver, and Denver I think is one of the most underrated teams in the NBA. Um, they're a great offensive team, but even so, like when I when I just analyze Cleveland and who's on their roster, it's like they have more like if you just look at roster to roster, they have they have better players than teams such as Utah, San Antonio. But all those other teams, it's just a matter of their commitment and how hard they try on defense, which to me is just upsetting because Cleveland, you know, everyone talks about it. Three of the guys that they acquired at the trade deadline are 25 years old. They're all long players. Jordan Clarkson has a long wingspan. So does Rodney Hood. Larry Nance is, he's not, I wouldn't, he's not that tall for his position, but he's still long. George Hill, obviously, has been a good defensive point guard since he's been in the NBA. So to me, it's just upsetting that they don't even – that they have such potential as a defensive team that I really do think that they could be a consistent top 10 team defensively, especially, I mean, they just have more talent than so many other teams, but it's just, they just don't seem to try. I'm not sure what it's for. What, I'm not sure what the reason for that is. 
Um, I think a lot of it, a lot of Cleveland's issues have to do with Teron Lou. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I was going to say, like, it seems like a lot of it just comes down to scheming and, like, the culture around the team where it's like, okay, we're going to go for a championship here, but the regular season doesn't matter that much. We're still not yeah. going to rest players, but, yeah, like, yeah. they just don't put in the effort that they need to be. And I think it's sad because, you know, Mike D'Antoni is known for not playing defense, and the Rockets are, I think, ninth yeah. in the league defense or something like that. And, like, you look at their – I mean, yeah, they have some good individual defenders. They have P.J. Tucker. They have Chris Paul. They have Luke and Bob Mute. But – and Clint Capella, obviously, is a very good defensive player. But their coach, Mike D'Antoni, he like he is he's like the the grandfather of like seven seconds or less offense. And it's just interesting to me that Cleveland just shows no desire to play defensively. Which I don't know. I mean, I remember last year when they were going through a similar issue when um, they uh, so I was I think I was I was watching some show and they were mentioning how in 2015 their first trip to the finals, Cleveland was top ten in defense. And then the year that they won the championship in 2016, they were also top 10 in defense. But then in 2017, they slipped to 22nd in defense. And everyone during the regular season was like, oh, you know, like, they'll flip the switch defensively when it gets to the playoffs. And, and they didn't. Yeah, and then they didn't. <laughs> and then they, they ended up losing handily to Golden State in five games. So I think, and then prior to the trade deadline this year, they were 30th. They were dead last in defense, like multiple defensive categories behind yeah. even the Sacramento Kings. And I, you know, there there aren't even real as of right now. I don't even think that that many that many real NBA players on the on the Sacramento Kings. Not to hate <laughs> on the Kings, but um, the uh, Kufis that is on the team. Costa, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't know. Yeah, Cleveland. Cleveland is they 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 are they are who I have been watching recently, and uh, their defensive struggles are what caught my eye for the most part. Yeah, and what really surprises me about Cleveland, just in terms of their overall season, they're actually projected to only have to have a point differential of zero point one. So they're projected to be an average team in terms of like how they're scoring, and they're just gonna have a bunch of clutch wins because you know LeBron is clutch, no matter what people want to say. And yeah, I agree. LeBron, I, I do think is a clutch player. Um, he doesn't get enough credit for it because he's had some issues in the past. But um, I think even in terms of how many games they'll win, I think Cleveland. Uh, I'm not sure what the pace is. So right now they're 36 and 26. And, um, you know, the rate that they're losing, I, honestly, I wouldn't be that surprised if they ended up only winning 48 or 49 games, which to me is a little bit like that's that's not good because Washington, the Wizards won 49 games last year. And, like, you know, what does it say if you're Cleveland and you have LeBron James and you have, a, you know, you have, good, you, have a, you have a deep team and you only win 48 to 49 games. I don't think that anyone could, you know, logically say that they were their championship level team if they're only winning forty eight to forty nine games. Yeah, and that would put them on pace for like the four in the either the fourth seed or, well, yeah, probably the fourth seed. But who knows? Maybe even fifth. Yeah. Seed. And depending yeah, they, on Washington. Yeah, and that could be a dangerous um, position for them. Yep, that is that is very true. So, I just calculated it, and they're currently on a forty seven win pace. Yeah. So, yeah. Um. That 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 is no good for Cleveland. It's, I mean, there's only half a game separating them and Washington, and Washington has been playing so well. So honestly, their only hope of being the third seed, in my opinion, is the fact that uh, you know maybe when John Wall comes back, they'll have some um, they'll have some chemistry issues. Yeah, and maybe just trying to reintegrate him a bit because Cleveland still has to you know they still have to reincorporate Kevin Love when he gets back into the mix. Yeah, uh, that'll probably be another challenge for them because no one on that team, um, other than Kyle Korver, J.R. Smith, Tristan Thompson, and LeBron James. Uh, have played with uh, Kevin Love. Or even soon. like him. Yeah. So, uh, I feel bad for Kevin Love. I like Kevin Love a lot. Yeah. But, um, but yeah. So Cleveland, yeah. That's that's about all there is to say about Cleveland right now. Well, well, there's one more thing that you, you told me about on uh, Friday, and that's uh, J.R. Smith throwing uh, soup at uh, the assistant oh, coach. Yep. <laughs> yeah, he did do that. Um, he, he, he said that he does not know what type of soup it was. Mm. Um, <laughs> as a... If, if that's of any importance, but J.R. Smith, I think, just needs to, at this point in his career, I think he needs to reevaluate um, that it is probably time for him to move to the bench officially because he's still starting on that team. Yeah, that's ridiculous. God knows why. Uh, Rodney Hood is a much more capable player. Rodney Hood is 25 years old. I honestly think that Rodney Hood should be playing 30, like 30 to 33 minutes a game. Yeah. Because um, he's he Rodney Hood is one of those players. Um, when he was in Utah that I thought that 
in a few years, once the current stars all started fading a little bit, like, you know, Kevin Durant wasn't as good anymore, Kawhi, Steph Curry, James Harden, Chris Paul, LeBron, all these other players, I thought Rodney Hood would be sort of like, he would be like, he wouldn't be like a, a super superstar, I didn't think, but I, I thought that he could be like a, like a second tier sort of star, like not as good as, but maybe in like a similar sense to somebody like Paul George, who plays really good defense, can shoot the ball. Um, and can, you know, average somewhere between 22 to 25 points a game. Yeah, and plenty so of I steals. Think Rodney should take that next step. Yeah, and absolutely. And, like, I, really, I think the only thing that's keeping J.R. Smith on this team at, at this point is, you know, how he's such a streaky shooter. He's been lucky enough to be really hot in the playoffs the past couple of years. I mean, just imagine if he had been cold in the past couple of playoffs, he'd be gone. Exactly. And also, uh, to that effect, um, to that, on that same note, J.R. Smith, I remember in the in the um, th- these past finals, the 2017 NBA Finals, in the first two games, um, he scored. I think no, J.R. Smith. I don't think I don't think he scored a point until the end of game two, and it was a three. Yeah, so for the first two games, his he averaged one and a half points per game. And then I remember in game, uh, I think maybe it was game three. Uh, I think he he finally came alive and he had. I don't know. I don't. I don't even think it was game three. There was one game that J.R. Smith came alive and he had twenty five points. But other than that, his his scoring total for the series was was pretty awful um, in terms of game by game. And so was Tristan Thompson's. Obviously, that that is part of the reason why they lost so handily. But I, I think J.R. Smith would because he is so streaky. I think it'd just be a better idea if you brought him off the bench for maybe twenty minutes a game or something like that. Because if you if he comes, J.R. Smith is one of those players where you can tell immediately whether or not he's going to have a good game. He's not one of those players who, like, they'll play, like, a quarter and then they'll start heating up or he'll play, like, you know, the first half and then in the second half he'll have a really good half. J.R. Smith is always in, like, you know, as as long as I've been watching him, he's always been a player who, if he starts the game hot, then he's going to have a good game. If he starts the game cold, he's not going to have a good game. So if he comes in off the bench and, you know, in his first five, six minutes he hits a three and, you know, he's playing well, then you can keep him in for a little bit. But yeah. then, you know, you don't risk – you don't run the risk of having your starting shooting guard only giving you, like, five points. So – I think Rodney Hood would be much more consistent as a starter. I think he's younger. I think he's, or he is younger, but I think he's more equipped defensively. I think he's a better shooter, more consistent shooter. Um, he's also a little bit streaky, but I think just at this point, just his athleticism and how quick he is uh, and how he can defend, I think he's just, I think it's just much more logical to have Rodney Hood in the starting lineup. Um, and even if you didn't want to do that, like if you, if Teron Lou is insistent, insistent on having Rodney Hood come off the bench, you could even start. Jordan Clarkson at the two. I mean, I, I know he's a little bit small. He's about six four, I think. Yeah. But you know, against some, a lot of the league is going small now, so I guess it wouldn't be that much of an issue. Like uh, the starting small forward on the Rockets is PJ Tucker. Yeah. He. he so, I mean, he has long arms, but still. Yeah. yeah I don't, he's not a tall player. I, I don't think. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just think J.R. Smith is, is sort of he's he's a deterrent to the Cavs' success. I think right now. Um, sometimes he can get hot, and sometimes you know he can. But I don't think that he can be your starting shooting guard in a series against any of these other teams. Because if you look at the matchups that we'll have, you know, it'll be J.R. Smith against DeMar DeRozan if they meet the Raptors. It'll be him against uh, either Jalen Brown or Jason Tatum when they meet the Celtics. Um, It will be – and then Indiana, it would be Victor Oladipo. And then Washington, it would be Bradley Beal or John Wall. And obviously the finals, it would be either James Harden, Chris Paul, or Steph Curry, Clay Thompson. I just don't think that – J.R. Smith at this point is, is clear that you can have in those situations. So I don't think I think Rodney Hood. The, the thing with Rodney Hood is I do think Rodney Hood has more potential to outplay. Like he can outplay Demar Derozan maybe for one game, or he can outplay Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown for the course of the whole series. And you know, he I'm, I don't think that he could outplay Clay Thompson or James Harden, but he could. You know, he could get relatively close. Like if James Harden or Clay Thompson have thirty, then maybe Rodney Hood could get you like nineteen or twenty-one or something like that. So I just think I think Rodney Hood would. I think the starting lineup for Cleveland should be George Hill, uh, and then this is when Kevin Love's come back. Kevin Love comes back. It should be George Hill, Rodney Hood, LeBron James, Kevin Love, and then at the four, I, I, I honestly I might have uh, Jeff Green in the starting lineup, just because he's been one of their more consistent players this season, and because he gives them. Because like you can have a slasher like Jeff Green in the lineup if you have a stretch big at center like Kevin Love. And Jeff Green is also just, I think that two through three with Rodney Hood, LeBron James, and Jeff Green, and even George Hill at point guard would give them four good defenders on the floor, which would allow for some hiding of Kevin Love since he's not a great defender. But because Kevin Love can rebound the ball, um, you know, I think that could be a very, very good starting lineup. 
Yeah, and you have probably the best equipment to put on the floor. And then Jordan Clarkson and Larry Nance have such good chemistry that it would make sense to put the two of them in the game together. So if you bring both of them off the bench, um, obviously you know they can do some they can do some action where they you know they throw lobs and they they get to the rim and they just play with a lot of energy. So I think it'd be best if you brought those two in at the same time and you let Rodney Hood and even with J.R. Smith. Obviously, if J.R. Smith is hot, then he can produce. Um, so I think that would just bolster their team. I think it would make them a lot better because recently it seems like they've had so many lineup struggles. They just don't know who to play. Yeah. I know. Like they really need to just start bringing the free pointers off the bench instead of starting them. Like they have Corver, they have J.R. Smith, they have uh, Calderon, who for a while was a great free point shooter. And like, they just need to bring them all in at the, off the, off the bench and then see who's hot. And then if they're not, they stay out and start players like Jeff Green, who, as you said, has been having a really good season so far. And, uh, yeah, like they they just need to be starting the right players at this point. Yeah, I think Teron Lue is not. Uh, I don't think Teron Lue is a championship caliber head coach. No, um, I like him. I like Teron Lue. He's a good guy. You know, he's uh, obviously he has some experience. You know, he he's famous for getting stepped over by Allen Iverson in the 2001 <laughs> yeah. finals. But I I do remember specifically when I was watching the 2016 NBA finals, I remember saying to myself that Teron Lue, in my opinion, he really did out coach Steve Kerr in that series. Yeah, because I. When I was watching it, J.R. Smith, I mean, uh, not J.R. Smith, Steve Kerr was, he was doing, he was making a, a few questionable decisions, at least in my mind. Um, he was playing, like, James McAdoo uh, in, in in big minutes in the, not big minutes, but he was playing James McAdoo for significant minutes of a seven-game series against Cleveland. And Teron Lu, um, every time that Golden State would take a lead in that series, like, you know how Golden State, when you watch them, it's like an avalanche. Like, you know, they'll yeah. hit one three, then they'll hit another, and then you look, like, you can honestly go to the bathroom and then come back, and the game lead will have switched by, like, 15 points. Oh, yeah. That's so, what makes them so fun. Yeah, they, yeah. But I remember in the in that final series, Teron Lu was calling timeouts so well. He was... He was playing all the right rotations. He was giving LeBron a lot of spacing. He was he was calling a lot of good plays. Um, and just mainly the thing to me, I think timeouts are extremely, I think they're an underrated element of basketball, but the way that he was calling timeouts to stop all of Golden State's, you know, avalanches so that they wouldn't build any momentum, he always cut it off. Like, he would never let a game swing by more than, like, I think 10 or 12 points. And I think that was, he did a really good job. But ever since then, I feel like Toronto has had a lot of, he, he, he slips up on so many small things and he just, they just don't know who to play. Like they, in the, the, one of the games that we were talking about on the five game homestand, they, in the fourth quarter, I think, I, I think it was the game against San Antonio, but I'm not a hundred percent sure, but he played, he didn't play a single starter other than LeBron in the fourth quarter. And to me, that's just a little, like, I guess you go with who's hot, but no one on the bench was hot. And I, I think to like, to not have a player like George Hill, who's very good defensively and can shoot the ball, not play in the fourth quarter, especially when he was having, he wasn't having a great game, but he was having a better game than some of the other guys to not play him in the fourth quarter. I thought was a little bit ridiculous and all around. I think uh, like they, they really just need to figure out their lineups. Cause I think if you brought in, uh, and, uh, you mentioned Jose Calderon, I think Jose Calderon, I really think that he, he can play. Like, I don't, yeah. Like he he held the fort like when Cleveland won 18 of 19 games earlier in the season, Jose Calderon was their starting point guard. And he's just he's a good fit to play alongside LeBron because he's a point guard that can shoot the ball. Yes. But um you know, even if they don't want to play Jose Calderon, I think that your second unit you would have to go with Jordan Clarkson at point guard, J.R. Smith a shooting guard, Kyle Corver, uh since he's six seven, he can play the small forward position. At the four you'd have to play Larry Nance and then I guess Tristan Thompson would come off the bench with those guys. Um so I think that's a pretty good uh, five-man unit off the bench. And then even if you didn't, you could, you know, honestly, if it came down to it and J.R. Smith is playing really poorly, you could even, you could put Kyle Korver at the two and then you could play LeBron with those four because if Le- I think LeBron with any shooter, like shooters in a lineup with LeBron are always dangerous yeah. just because of how good a job he does of, you know, take, clogging up the pain and, you know, kicking it out to, to open wide open teammates. So, yeah, I think, I think Cleveland really just does need some lineup adjustments. Yeah, and to your point in that uh, Spurs game, they only brought in uh, Calderon for one minute, and like he's the exact, he is the exact kind of player LeBron needs. LeBron needs a guy who doesn't distribute the ball from point guard because I, I, it worked for a while with uh, Kyrie, but obviously it led to eventual strife with who, who's going to be the number one on the team. So he needs somebody who's willing to take a step back, but he also needs somebody who can pass the ball in Calderon's. 
you know, average with it, but he's much better at his free throw shoot and his free pointers. And even though he's not a great defender, he's better than some of the other Cavs. So, like, there's not much of a reason why he shouldn't be playing at least more minutes than J.R. Smith. Yeah, I, especially right now, I, I think I think the one of the main reasons for George uh, for George Hill being acquired was, I think George Hill is sort of a better version of Jose Calderon. He's a little bit younger. Um, he's I wouldn't say he's a better shooter, but he's a better defender. But yeah, I think George Hill uh, so far in his stretch, I think he's he had one really good game. Uh, he he scored like twenty six points. I can't remember who it was against, but you know, I think when again, I don't want to shut the door on them too soon because I know like with every new team like. Every LeBron team has struggles out of the gate. So um, I, I just hope that, you know, by the middle of this month, they'll have it figured out um, and can win some games because the way that it's looking right now, like, I, I, I really don't think they're going to win 50 games, which I think would be – this would be the – I, I don't a even the last time LeBron didn't win 50 games. Yeah, it'd be like the Spurs not winning 50 games. But, I mean, they have an excuse this year at least. Yeah, I, yeah, and I think I honestly think the Spurs have a relatively easy schedule coming. I think so. I think they they probably will pull it out, especially with um, the rumors that Kawhi could be coming back at the end of this month. Yeah, I I, I don't know what to think about that Kawhi situation. But uh, before, uh, yeah, we've been keeping a secret from you guys. Uh, Rod and I have, uh, well, I guess I have decided, but uh, and we're thinking about uh, just watching like an NBA game during each of these recordings and our. Uh, Game for this time is going to be the Hawks and Suns. Do you want to uh, preview that game before we get started, or? Yeah, sure. I mean, I don't think there's going to be that much to say because it is Phoenix and Atlanta. But um, you know, John. Con- oh, yeah. Actually, the the Hawks just played a very good game against uh, against the Warriors, so um, it could be a little bit interesting to watch them play. John Collins is an exciting player. Dennis Schroeder, I think, is an underrated player. Dwayne Dedman also an underrated player, but. I guess there's not that much to say. Yeah, I'm looking forward to. Uh, crap, I forget his name. Uh, their uh, who's their power forward? The Hawks. Yeah. I think it's John Collins. Oh, okay. Then yeah, I guess I'm thinking of John Collins. Yeah, I'm excited to see how he does. I have been hearing reading a lot of good things about him. Yeah, yeah, he is a very athletic player. He was he was one of the people who threw down a he threw down a spectacular dunk in the Rising Stars game. Yeah. Oh, oh, wait, I was thinking of Kent Bazemore, my bad, who isn't even a forward. No. But, He's yeah. a small forward, I believe. Oh, okay. Well, emphasis on small. Yeah. Um, I think this link that we have is not working, though. Oh, that's not good. Hmm. I'll see if I can hunt any, anything down in the meantime. But uh, let's see. What, what else is there to talk about around the league? So it, what... What about the Kyrie situation makes you think he's coming back at the end of March? I kept hearing that like he wasn't even going to play for the rest of the season. The Kawhi, you mean? Yeah. Uh, Kawhi, oh, I heard um, uh, Adrian Wojnarowski reported that uh, he had he was he had returned to the team, he's traveling with the team, and that he's working with the team, uh, Greg Popovich and the training staff and R.C. Buford and everyone. Uh, they've all been working together on a plan to get him reintegrated into the lineup by, I think, their, I think their date was like March... 24th or something like that um and adrian warzanowski is a very very credited credited reporter so i typically i mean he's usually right about about things that he says so i know that he wouldn't be reporting it if it wasn't you know if there wasn't some merit to it so i think i think Kawhi could be back um but i know that greg popovich also said that depending on how late he wants to how late he's going to come back uh he might not he might not let him play uh just because it would ruin team chemistry i guess heading into the playoffs um so yeah, just based on the that's, that's how I heard that he was, he'd be coming back. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, the Suns, I, not the Suns, why did I say the Suns? Uh, the Spurs, yeah, I'm, it, personally I'm expecting them to come just short of uh, those 50 wins, but I'm really curious to see how they hold up in the playoffs with so many young players. I mean, obviously they still have Manu and uh, Tony Parker, but it'll be very interesting to see. I think the Spurs are one of those teams that year in and year out, you can always expect them to win at least one series. Um, and depending on where they fall in the, the, depending on the standings, I really think that it could be interesting. Cause as of right now, I think the Spurs are, uh, they're currently sixth because all those teams have the same yeah. record. But if you look at them right That's now, good. 
playoffs started today, their third seed matchup would be Portland. And I am, <laughs> I really wouldn't put any money on Portland beating the Spurs. Um, honestly, I think San Antonio in the first round, uh, I really think that they're a team that unless they fall to seven or eight and end up playing Houston or Golden State, I don't see them like those are the only teams that I could see San Antonio losing to because I've learned like in the in my viewership of the NBA to never ever count on the Spurs. Oh, um, and if they if the Spurs get matched up with a team like Minnesota or New Orleans or Denver or Portland or any of those teams in the first round, I, I really like even if Minnesota's the let's let's say Minnesota's the four seed and San Antonio is the five seed and it's a four five matchup between Minnesota and San Antonio, I would probably put my money on it. On San Antonio, even though I do I do like the Timberwolves, but San Antonio, I think we'll probably get to the second round and end up losing to either Golden State, Houston, um, or maybe Oklahoma City. Oh, now it's getting you. Yeah, sorry about that. I I even muted my browser and it still like overrided it. Oh. Is that you or me? Oh, uh, that's you. Let's see. Hopefully we didn't get copyright infringement for that. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so, yeah, I, I I would take the Spurs in that matchup against the Trailblazers just as well, but and you can always count on Pop to just do an amazing job coaching, but they'd certainly benefit a lot if Kawhi was around. Oh, jeez. One moment. <laughs> these, uh... That's the problem with these pirating websites. They love to get their sound screwed up. Yeah. All right, there we go. Okay. There we go. So has anyone uh, really uh, pulled away for the West uh, number one seed in your mind? Uh, no, I think uh, right now, I think, uh, honestly, here's I, I saw this somewhere as well, but I think that... Uh, it was it was a it was a discussion basically about how important the number one seed is to Golden State, and uh, in my opinion, I think it is relatively important because, um, you know, I'm not I'm not trying to discredit Golden State or anything because obviously they've done an amazing job the past few years, but I think Golden State has they have been a little bit uh, lucky in terms of who they faced in, in in terms of who they faced and just in terms of the injuries, like because this is something that no one I think talks about or really discusses. But um, I know everyone discusses how, like, in the conference finals last year against uh, the Spurs, Kawhi Leonard got injured in game one. Everyone knows that. Yeah. But that took Kawhi Leonard, who was, you know, their best player out for that entire series, which was a problem. And then even in the series before that, Rudy Gobert yes. missed, I think, the first three games of that series. And they were facing the Jazz. And, you know, Golden State, the, their one weakness as a team is the fact that they don't really have – they don't really have a good center or a good big man um, who can really play against the likes of someone like Rudy Gobert or Anthony Davis or, you know, DeAndre Jordan and Andre Drummond, those types of players. So I think if Rudy Gobert played in that series, I, I honest and Utah is, Utah is sort of like a San Antonio to me where their system is very good and they're a very good defensive team and they have some people who can get hot offensively. I really think that Utah probably could have taken maybe one game or maybe even two if they played perfectly in a series against Golden State last season. Yeah. Um, so injuries really – because Rudy Gobert is an amazingly underrated player. He's an amazing shot Incredible. blocker, a good rebounder. Um, and he's so tall. like he, He's like 7'2", Stifle yeah. Towers is his nickname. And his really reach good. is literally like 7'9", which is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's like he, he can really defend. and. Golden State, just with the way that they play, even though they are, you know, they do shoot a lot of threes. Most of Golden State, Golden State's offense is essentially threes and layups, and the number of layups that they like, they would not be getting. I don't think they'd probably be getting like you know, maybe like nine to ten less layups a game if Rudy Gobert is there. Like he'd probably have to shoot way many more jump shots. So I think that injury was extremely underrated in uh, easing Golden State's path to uh, to the finals last year, and then even in the series before that. They played Portland in the first round. Yeah. And Portland, Yusuf Nurkic was injured for the entire series. And he is another one of those players who's really good and can beat you up on the inside. And, uh, you know, so basically the, the every every opponent that they played had an injured starter, um, you know, in Kawhi and then Yusuf Nurkic and Rudy Gobert. Um, so the number one seed helped them out a lot with that because obviously they got home court advantage throughout um, 
throughout the, you know, they didn't have to go on. Cause I think if last year, if, uh, Golden, if uh, San Antonio was a two seed last year, they won 61 games. If San Antonio had, uh, yeah, so San Antonio won 61 games last year. And then in their last five games of the season last year, they, they, uh, they lost four or five. Um, and if they had won, you know, if they had won on a five game winning streak, then, you know, obviously they would be in contention for the number one seed. I think if San Antonio, um, played at home in game one, I, I mean, I, you know, this is just like, just because it would have been a different situation and Zaza Pachulia wouldn't have the support of the crowd and been like, Oh, like it was an accident or whatever. I yeah. feel like he probably wouldn't go out of his way to Kawhi in, in a, in a game that's in San Antonio. And then if they start the series in San Antonio and, you know, San Antonio wins 2-0 and at home, you go back to Golden State and you never know. So, um, and then even in 2015, I believe they played. Uh, yeah, there was, know, the, played there was the Clippers series, obviously, where uh, Chris Paul got injured and then Blake Griffin got injured and that was a big help. And I think there were some injuries in that uh, Rockets finals. Yeah, I think the Rockets were playing without one injured starter. I can't remember who it was in 2015. And then, I mean, they played New Orleans, but like New Orleans only had like New Orleans only ever really has one player. Um, or, or well, prior to them getting it, uh, Demarcus Cousins, they only really ever had one player. Yeah. So there wasn't a, there wasn't much to say. And uh, I can't. I think Golden State played uh, Memphis in the in the second round that year in 2015. I'm not sure about that, but I I, I think it was Memphis. And um, if it was Memphis, then I, obviously I wouldn't be surprised if Memphis also had an injury then yeah, because they're always beat up. Memphis is always beat up, yeah. But it, and like it is to their credit that they were able to get the f- first seed every year. But you can also say that they never really had a great competition for the first seed. Like obviously the Spurs were always a good for uh, competition for them, but they only ever had Kawhi. And like the fact that they were even able to compete that well was uh, astonishing. Getting sixty-seven wins like uh, two years ago, I believe. No, just last yeah. year. Yeah, it, it was sixty-seven wins in twenty sixteen, and then sixty-one wins last year. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, and then obviously I think that resulted in Kawhi Leonard making an all. Uh, he made All NBA first team over Kevin Durant uh, last year. Yeah, uh, which I thought was very. I interesting. mean, that was just um, some Durant hate, but yeah, yeah, that that, is, that was also some. I mean, honestly, but last year I, I really wouldn't take it away from Kawhi because he finished third in MVP voting. Yeah. Um. So, uh, but yeah, uh, basically to answer your question, I think the first seed. I really, uh, just to make things more interesting, I really think I, I really hope Houston has it because if Houston does have it. Um, it would be the first time that Golden State has to go on the road to start a series since 2014. Oh, good um, point. They have they have not started a series on the road uh, since since 2014 when they were the sixth seed uh, in those playoffs. So, because yeah, every every series they've started at home, and obviously Oracle is one of the one of the best arenas to play in for a home team because they're they're so loud, they're so energetic, they're so into it. So you know, I think that. Uh, I think that it's important to that, but the thing is that if Golden State does, you know, the Popovich thing where they rest some of their starters for games down the stretch in order to get them rest, it'll change things because it, you know, you basically, I think Steve Kerr is in an interesting situation where you either play all your starters and then, you know, you get home court advantage or you can, you know, you can rest them and then be the two seed and then. Because the thing is with Golden State is like if you if they're they're probably gonna they would win their first two matchups regardless of whether or not they have home court. Yeah, it unless, wouldn't come up until unless, later. Unless, in my opinion, unless they play Oklahoma City in the second round, I think I, I don't think Oklahoma City would beat them, but I think Oklahoma City could give them trouble because if you start the you know. But yeah, like basically, home court advantage doesn't really matter for Golden State until the conference finals, anyway. So. If they, if I was Steve Kerr, I would honestly try and go for a home court advantage, only because, like you know how well it's worked for you so far. So why would you try and prove otherwise? Yeah. Because, you know, if you if you go on the road, you play Houston. Houston wins both the first two games, and you're really like that's a real problem. Oh yeah. Well, you have all the media against you, and the players are going to be shocked because I I don't I can't remember the last time the the Golden State Warriors have been down in the series since they lost to the Cavs. So. They haven't oh, been in that position. Yeah, because if you remember in uh, in 2016 when they were playing Oklahoma City in the conference finals. Oh, good point. The, yeah. The the hate for Golden State was immense. Like everyone was like, "Wow, like you guys won 73. You're not even about to make the finals. You guys are down three one." And that was um, that was one of the most horrifying series. <laughs> the second half of that series was depressing to watch. How Oklahoma City collapsed. That was so so depressing. Yeah. But you know. 
I, they ended up winning because if, I think if Game Seven was on the if Game Seven was on the road for Golden State in that series, I really don't think Golden State would have made it to the finals. Um, so yeah, you know, if Houston and Golden State goes to Game Seven and they play in Houston, Houston is going to be the favorite because you know home court advantage really does mean something these days. So. Yeah, and to your to your earlier point, that was one of the first series where the Golden State Warriors were really injured. Like uh, Steph Curry yeah, was coming exactly. off. Yeah, exactly. And back to the point. Yeah, back to what we were talking about earlier. The one year that they, the one year that Golden State had trouble getting out of the Western Conference was in 2016. And you know, some people don't think that there's that much of a correlation between like you know how much you rest and stuff like that. But if you play a seven game conference final series where you're down three one. That's going to take a lot out of you, and then. You know, then you have to go and you have to play a seven-game series in the finals. Like that's that's a lot. So it's a lot of games and it's a lot of pressure on you know these players' like bodies and like the travel is awful to have to fly from Oakland to Oklahoma City and then Oklahoma City back to Oakland and then Oakland to Cleveland and then Cleveland all the way back to Oakland. Like that travel is 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 crazy. So yeah, and then that that year they also had a they lost a game to Portland. And Steph Curry was injured in the first round because he, he he landed on his knee. They played five games against Houston. They played five games against Portland, and then they played seven games against Oklahoma City. So that was their toughest year coming out of the West, and that was the one year where they you know they didn't win the championship. So I think that if they have a tough time coming out of the West this year, then obviously it softens them up for uh, for whoever comes out of the East. Assuming oh, like, oh these Hawks suck. <laughs> Sorry. Oh yeah, I think the tip off is just happening for me. Oh okay, so my bad. Uh, they're going to suck in a couple minutes. <laughs> oh, what is going on with this guy's hair? Right, I'll, I'll let you see it later, but yeah, definitely. And I think something interesting to transition to is we've been talking about how injuries affect a team's playoff chances. Uh, the Timberwolves, uh, it, it seems like they're uh, having a lot of troubles without uh, Jimmy Butler. And I'm sure you're not too happy about that. Yeah, I'm an avid Timberwolves fan, but I'm wearing a Timberwolves uh, sweater right now, actually. But... Um... Uh, they, they that is such a sad story to me because this team has not made the playoffs in 14 years since Kevin Garnett was the MVP of the league. So for them to 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 you know uh, like potentially miss the playoffs, like they've they have Minnesota has been firmly in the fourth seed the entire season. Like like from the jump, it it was always like up until recently when the West became so so jam packed tight between like seeds three through ten. The, the, the top four were definitive the entire year. It was go, either Golden State or Houston, number one, whoever else at number two, like, you know, between those two. And then three was San Antonio, and then four was Minnesota. And that had not wavered the entire year. Like, yeah. every time I check the standings for the first, like, 50, 55, like, before the All-Star break, basically, whenever you check the standings, Minnesota was always fourth. And then, you know, every now and then they would get up to three if San Antonio lost a game. But basically, they were three or four the whole year. And then Jimmy Butler goes out and he tears his meniscus in the first game back from the All-Star break. And it's like, what the heck? Like, now this team is really not positioned. Like, they, they could legitimately be the eighth seed in the playoffs. Yeah. And, and Jimmy they would Butler really suffer. Be coming back full health. I don't, like, he's, he said that he's going to try and play in the, like, right before the playoffs start. But, like, to have to get reintegrated back that's into, too late. you know, your team right before the play, like, that sucks. Like, what, what player has ever had a great, like, playoffs after returning from an injury like you know obviously there's like michael jordan in like 1986 yeah. or whatever year it was that he dropped 63 but like and then that's, kevin an Garnett. that's not gonna happen yeah and obviously there's kevin durant but he was there for a lot more of the season and he was he also well no i was gonna say he also had been there the previous season but that's not true oh you're talking about last year in golden state yeah but that's a different case but I, the thing with that is like jimmy butler I, okay like again i'm not trying to hate on golden state or anything but Kevin Durant's role in Golden State, I think, is, like, Kevin Durant can, like, if, if you're in a situation like him, like, you can ease into that situation because you know even if you don't play that well, like, Draymond Green will be on. Draymond is there. Clay is there. Steph is there. But with Jimmy Butler, like, Jimmy Butler is the leader of the team because Carl Anthony Towns is, is still a young player. This is only his third season in the NBA. And, like, he, I don't think Carl Anthony Towns, despite how good of a player he is, I don't think that he... You know, just in terms of a leader, I don't think he's been around long enough to lead a team to, like, deep into the playoffs. So I think Jimmy Butler is, I don't want to say more important to the Timberwolves than Kevin Durant was to the Warriors, but in terms of how valuable the, his level of play would be, like, I think that Jimmy Butler's situation is much, much more difficult. 
because like even without Durant, like you know, the Warriors probably could have went. Like the, the Warriors probably still would have made the finals last year, even without Kevin Durant, based on the fact that they won seventy three the year before. Yeah. Uh, so you know, Jimmy Butler tearing his meniscus, I think, is one of the most tragic injuries uh, this season. Obviously, you know, after Gordon Hayward's was bad, Demarcus Cousins was bad. So yeah, I think I would put this at number three. Yeah. Do you do you think it, it really had a lot to do with how uh, Thibodeau uh, pushes his uh, veterans so hard? Like I know Jimmy Butler. I, really, I think that's actually a problem because um, there, someone made a list, I think, and the number of players who have been hurt under Tom Thibodeau's either coaching or assistant coaching is is actually pretty remarkable, and it always ends up being something in these players' knees and their legs. Yeah, just because of how he uh, he. he in like on defense, he really prioritizes players moving around a lot and stopping and starting. And I yeah, stopping, starting, shifting your knees, turning, like all these sorts of things. Like Derrick Rose obviously has well documented injury history. Kevin Garnett's career changed after he blew out his knee in two thousand nine. Then you have obviously Jimmy Butler and the meniscus tear. Jimmy Butler's had knee injuries before, like when he played in uh, in Chicago under Tibbs. Like he had like you know some he had some small like issues like you know like knee strains and like knee soreness, and he would miss a few games here and there. But I think it's very interesting how in the All Star game Jimmy Butler chose not to play. Yeah. Because and then like it just, it was almost like foreshadowing like oh yeah like you know I need a break from how much Tibbs runs us and then like as soon as the first game back he, he tears his meniscus. But I do think Tom Thibodeau does need to rely not rely but he just need he needs to play his bench more like I remember last season Zach Levine, uh, <laughs> Zach Levine, Carl Anthony Towns, and Andrew Wiggins, all three of them were in the top four in minutes played yeah yeah in minutes per game like that that's obscene like and oh zach levine as well zach levine tore his acl playing for tibbs <laughs> so you know the list is just crazy of all these guys that have gotten their legs hurt playing for tom Thibodeau. I, I think he just needs to relax a little bit he needs to play starters you know he needs to play more like 32 to 34 minutes as opposed to 37 to 40 minutes yeah yeah um, and in one of those games he, where uh he, he, what was it? Uh, it was like a couple. Uh, no, it was. Uh, yeah, it was like two games ago for the Timberwolves. Uh, there was like a twenty-point blowout for the Timberwolves, and like all of the starters were still in there, and like that's completely unnecessary. And you don't need your players playing thirty-eight minutes a game. You can get by on thirty-six or thirty-four, and you're exactly. You know, like it just they're young players, sure, but they can still get injured, as we saw with Jimmy Butler. And uh, I I was listening to uh, on uh, Five Thirty Eight's uh, NBA podcast, hot uh, not hot take down. It was used to be called that, the Lab. Uh, apparently, Jimmy Butler he also led not led the league. He was a uh, in third place in uh, load, which is just the amount of strain that's put on your knees by stopping and starting, which apparently the NBA can calculate now, which is super cool. So that yeah. was not helping anything. And yeah, then, and I think he's been one of those players, I think, for a long time. Like, he led the league in minutes played in uh, 2016, it was, or 2015, one of the, a few years ago when he was playing. I think it was the last year he was playing under Tibbs. Um, so, yeah, I think that would be 2015. Yeah. Um, and, like, but, a, more more so to your point, uh, not only did he not play an All-Star game, which wasn't that remarkable, you, you, you usually see, like, one or two players play, like, two or three minutes, but he didn't even practice at the All-Star game. Yeah, I, I think... He, he's, I just feel bad for the guy because, you know, this was his year really to like, to really like, I, I guess prove that he, he is one of, because in my honest opinion, I really think Jimmy Butler's like, just, just based on what he does defensively, I think there's a legit, legitimate argument that he's a top 10 player in the NBA. Yeah. Um, I think if he won a series in the Western Conference and, you know, he, you know, in the second round, as a four seed, he would have played either Golden State or Houston. And if he could get a game off of them, like I think he would really do a lot for his career, and it would like it would just do a lot to cement him more as one of the top players in the league because I think he's one of the more underrated stars in the league. Um, you know, just because he's not necessarily flashy, like he doesn't do all the, he doesn't shoot a bunch of threes, he doesn't do crazy layups and stuff like that. But I love Jimmy Butler; he's one of my favorite players, and I really hope that he comes back before the they get to the playoffs. Yeah, me too. It's been really nice for the Nuggets to have uh, Paul Millsap back, and I want yeah, to see the same thing. Well from... He hit it. He uh, he was defending LeBron very well. Yeah, and I just want to see the same thing from Timberwolves because it's been so nice to finally have him be good for the first time in forever. Yeah, you know their their jerseys are cool. Their players are good. They're um, I don't know. I, I think Thibodeau, I think Thibodeau just he's a very good coach. I think he just doesn't understand like. 
I, I don't, I don't, to me, it doesn't make sense how he wouldn't know that he has this reputation of overplaying his players. And like, he has watched so many of his players get hurt. Like, uh, you know, 2009, I mentioned Kevin Garnett, he was an assistant coach and I think Thibodeau was in charge of the defense. Um, Cause you know, sometimes they do that. Like they, you know, you'll get an assistant coach to primarily consider defense. That's what Mike D'Antoni does as well. And, you know, Kevin Garnett, I'm sure that stat that you were just mentioning about a uh, load, uh, stopping and starting, I'm sure Kevin Garnett, you know, when he was, when he was in Boston, cause he, I think he won a defensive player of the year in 2008. Like, obviously he would have a huge load defensively. So, um, that could obviously be part of why Kevin Garnett got hurt. And that, that, you know, that injury potentially changed the end of the two thousands. Um, yeah, that's a good point with the Celtics, the Celtics thing. Cause I legitimately believe that if the Celtics, uh, this is a tangent, but if, you know, if Kevin Garnett never got hurt, I, I definitely could have seen, uh, an, a, you know, a Celtics Lakers rematch in 2009. And then obviously 2010, you know, because Rondo was coming into his own in the 2009 playoffs. That's really when he broke out. So, you know, if Kevin Garnett ever got hurt, that team would be would be very different. Yeah, and like just looking at how they did in the two thousand was it two thousand seven, two thousand eight, or two thousand eight? Yeah, yeah. So like just eight. just how they did in that playoffs, they they had a lot of talent despite them getting older, and like they, they weren't past their prime at that point. It wasn't the Brooklyn Nets or anything, and like yeah. that. It wasn't when it was twenty thirteen fourteen, and they were just trying to, you know, do whatever. Yeah. Speaking of the Celtics, uh, yeah, how have you feel, felt like they've really separated themselves at all from the Raptors? Uh, I don't. I think the Raptors are still the best team in the Eastern Conference. I say that ahead of Cleveland um, because Toronto to me is uh, – <laughs> I read this somewhere, but I, I don't really think – I don't – I'm not going to go this far as to say this is true, but uh, someone compared this, uh, this Toronto team to the 2011 Dallas Mavericks when the Mavericks won the championship sort of out of nowhere. Hmm. Um, uh, I, I don't think Toronto is going to do that, but I think Toronto is – they're one of those teams in a similar situation to to the to Dallas, where you know Dallas in 2011 they were they were one of those teams that was like they always have a good regular season and then they get to the playoffs they win a series and then they just sort of fall apart and nothing happens and it's the same story every year and you know that is sort of the the story with Toronto but you know just because they have uh, this is the weakest East in terms of who the Raptors will play because. You know, if you look at who the Raptors have played the past few seasons, um, they've played series against teams that are built well to face them. Uh, I think in I think it was uh, in 2016. You know, they they faced the Pacers, and the Pacers gave them trouble. But that makes sense because Paul George is a player who's probably just as good as Demar Derozan is, and uh, you know, Derozan obviously has some off nights. And then there was a series they played against Miami where they needed like a, a half buzzer beater from Kyle Lowry to tie the first game they've played like series against and Dwayne Wade was having an amazing playoffs that year oh that yeah was, that was the year where they played that was the year where Miami played two game sevens they mm -hmm. played a game seven against Charlotte in the first round uh they were the third seed actually Miami this was the year before Dwayne Wade went to Chicago yeah and the year of the four teams being uh, tied for the same record yeah 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 it was that year and they uh you know like Toronto just had a tough road in 2016 because I think that was the that was the year where they won fifty six games. They were the second seed, and everyone was like, "Oh, like watch out for Toronto." Like, and then they played Cleveland in a six game series, and I, I don't even remember the last time that was. I think that's the last time Cleveland's played um, a six game series in the East. Yeah, um, probably the first time he's played a six game series. Oh no, they, I think LeBron has only played like two six game series in the East since he's been back in Cleveland, and it was that one, and then one against Chicago the year before. But yeah, I believe it. Yeah, and. I don't know. I think Toronto just how free flowing their offense is, how well DeMar DeRozan has been playing, um, and just the production that they're getting out of like random players. Like it's just it's it's something it's really good to watch. It's and they're them and Golden State are the only teams that are top five offensively and defensively. And you know, regardless of the conference they're playing in or anything, like there's no mistake that like <laughs> how how can it be that there are only two teams in that category and it's Toronto and Golden State. So. I think Toronto. Uh, I think if they play, I think Toronto right now is better equipped to beat Boston in a series simply because, um, you know, Kyrie. I think is not at the. I don't think he's at the level where he can win a series by himself. No. Um, and he just, and that's that's not to take away from him, but he just he's not surrounded with enough right now because, 
you know, Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, by the time that they get to the playoffs, it'll be like, it'll be way, way, way more many games than they're used to playing. Especially Tatum, you know, Jalen Brown, already, he's already played in a, a season in the playoffs and everything, but still, he's still 21. Jason Tatum just turned 20 yesterday, so. And Al Horford, I don't think, is as good as he used to be, so. You know, just Kyrie, S.O., oh, and uh, Brad Stevens also ruled that uh, he said Gordon Hayward will not be coming back this season. Oh, I didn't see that. That's yeah, he, he, ruled, he ruled Hayward out for the rest of the season, so. Um, I just don't, I don't have that much faith in Boston uh, getting to the finals. So I think Boston will probably lose um, in the second round. Yeah. No, like if the Raptors can get healthy, I think that could happen. And frankly, I would love to see it happen because not that Dwayne Casey deserves it at this point, but DeRozan and Lowry and just the entire bench. And like they've performed well enough to do it at this point. They just need to show that they can do it in the playoffs too. Yeah, I think the, the issue with Kyle Lowry, I think Kyle Lowry's shot always seems to disappear yes. when he enters the playoffs. It's so strange. Like it's like every year he'll be shooting the lights out. Like he'll be shooting like somewhere like I think two seasons ago or last season he shot like forty, close to forty percent from three. And then just as soon as the playoffs come, like he 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 was posting like the worst shooting percentages in the playoffs ever. And he uh, like it's just so weird what happens to him every year. But I think that, like I think at this point like there's not that much pressure on Toronto because no one's really expecting anything from them. Um, so I, I think they're they're less prone to choking in like a big situation this year, and I think that could really help them out. I think that uh, I, I think it's just too difficult for anyone to say that Toronto is a favorite to win the East because I'm not going to say that either. Yeah, uh, I, I wouldn't be like I'm not going to say they're a favorite, but I really wouldn't be a hundred. I, I wouldn't be totally thrown off or surprised if they made it out of the East. I think as they're constructed right now, they're playing much better than Cleveland, and just in terms of you know. I think since Kevin Love is not back yet, I think overall their team is better than Cleveland. So, you know, because Serge Ibaka is also on that team, he's, a, he's yeah. still still a really good player. And then you have, uh, you know, Fred Van Vliet is playing well off the bench. And but you know they have some they have some good players. They have a I think OG Anunoby I think is on that team. Yes, the rookie. He's playing well. Pascal Siakam is playing well. Uh, Jonas Valanciunas he's he's a He's a consistent player. The, the problem with him is that he's, he never really broke out like people expected him to, but he's still a good player. Um, and, you know, so Toronto, Toronto, I think uh, I think they're still the best team in the East. I just don't think they'll win the East. Yeah, and I, I would really love to see them win, win it all because they've never won a championship before, and every time in the playoffs I always just root for whatever team hasn't won a championship yet. Yeah, and I, I just think it'll be cool because um, – uh, I, I would prefer to see Toronto against, like, I know a lot of people want to see the whole Kyrie-LeBron conference. No, finals I don't. And, like, is it going to be LeBron gets to eight straight or is it going to be Kyrie gets to four straight? And, like, I do agree that's sort of a cool conversation to have, but I just don't think that, like, I, it wouldn't be fair to Kyrie because, like, I think if Kyrie ended up losing that series, people would unfairly be like, oh, like, he wanted to leave, he left LeBron, this shows him, like, he lost, like, I don't think it's really fair because he would be going up against town. Like he would be playing against Kevin Love, LeBron James, George Hill, you know, Larry Nance, Rodney Hood, Jordan Clarkson. Like he would be playing against all these legit NBA players. And the only people who I guess are like, he has like Terry Rozier and, you know, Marcus Smart and Aaron Baines and, you know, the two young guys. And then he's got Al Horford and this, the supporting cast around Kyrie is not nearly as good as the one around LeBron. So, for that reason, if he lost in the conference finals, I think he'd get unfairly criticized. Um, I just think that that team is not built to win a championship yet. Uh, I think they're they're still one piece away. I think Gordon Hayward coming back, and then I think uh, they should make a move in the off season to uh, trade the their first. They have a they have the Lakers first round pick, I believe. It's it's like there's something weird. It's like the lake. It's called the Lakers Kings pick. Yeah, it's like a and, conditional. Yeah, it's some condition. So like they they could they could trade that pick, package it with a couple players, and maybe bring in like another, you know, not necessarily you don't have to bring in like a superstar player, but just another good player um, who's maybe on the trade block, come off season. So yeah, I think I think Boston just right now I don't think they're ready. So mm-hmm. I think it'd be cool to see Toronto. I think the the final four teams I think should be Toronto, Cleveland, Houston, and Golden State. Um, and I think it'd be because we saw Boston and Cleveland last year, so. I think it'd be good to get a little rematch from 2016. It could be fun, especially I think the Raptors would would want it um, because 
I think they sort of have a chip on their shoulder losing to LeBron every year because they lost to him in 16 and they lost to him in last season. In the second round, they got swept. So I just think that they would be playing a little bit revitalized and they wouldn't have to worry this time about Kyrie torching them from the perimeter because they don't really, you know, that was a big issue for them. Kyrie consistently played well against them, so... Yeah, and just to uh, recap, uh, what, what's the deal with the the that Lakers pick? Uh, apparently, it'll go to uh, Philadelphia if the pick is the number one overall, or in between six through thirty. So there's a very narrow window for where the Celtics can actually get the pick. But seeing it, the recent performance by the Lakers, unless they're number one, they might actually go to uh, the Celtics. So that'd be helpful. But yeah, these, yeah. Um, and what about the Kings one? It's called the Lakers Kings pick. Does it go to the uh, Lakers Kings? Let me see. Uh, yeah, I think, or maybe that's twenty nineteen. Yeah, yeah. There's a twenty nineteen one for from the Sixers or the Kings. If uh, let me see. Uh, so if if Phil if the Philadelphia pick, I'm sorry, if the Lakers pick from two thousand eighteen goes to Philadelphia, then Philadelphia has to give them a first round pick in twenty nineteen. But if oh, it, okay. if it goes to the Celtics, then the Kings have to give their first round pick. Okay, but see. that Kings pick is protected for the number one overall, and then they get nothing if they get the number one overall pick. I see. So basically, the Celtics only get the 2018 pick if it's two, three, four, five. Yes, which may happen, but yeah, I mean the lottery is crazy. You never know. So, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, but honestly, yeah, for the, uh, the Celtics could trade that uh, before the draft. Even they could just trade it before the draft. And yeah, that'd then, be uh, the time to do it. Yeah, they should trade it before the draft, I think, and package it with maybe, like, you know, I'm not really sure who they would try and trade for because most of the stars at this point seem to be in relatively good situations. Um, you know, there's no, there's no like, Paul George's like there was last year. Um, yeah. So, but, you know, there's all this free agency as well. I'm not sure how much cap room the Celtics have, but, you know, they, they could maybe figure out a sign and trade for a pretty good player and just... I think next year they'll be much better poised because LeBron might will probably be gone. Um, yeah, I don't so. know about from the East, but at the very least, he would have to be developing chemistry, and maybe you'd see like a 2010-2011 Miami Heat situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I agree. Yeah, I think the Celtics and Sixers... Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Celtics and Sixers, I think, are the teams of the future in the East, uh, you know, once LeBron starts fading a little bit. But, um, so, no, that'll be interesting, yeah. but... As far as the East goes right now, yeah, I think the favorites are Cleveland, then Toronto, then Boston. And then I think the conference final series between Toronto and Cleveland should be pretty good. Yeah, and I, I, I was really hoping for the season that it would be more so the Bucs as the future, but they just have not been able to do much, even after Jason Kidd has been fired. Yeah, the Bucks. I don't really know what it is. I know Giannis Antetokounmpo, he's an anomaly, he's a great player, but he is... There's something weird about him in the, in the sense that he's like he's just as talented as these other young players. Like he's just as talented in my eyes as LeBron was. Um, you know, not just as maybe like maybe a little bit less talented than LeBron was because he can't really pass the same way. But in terms of scoring and rebounding and shot blocking and defense, like he's an amazing player. But there's just something about it. He just doesn't. And I feel like it, some of it has to do with consistency because, you know, some days I'll look at the box score that the Bucks have and Hull have only scored like 11 points or something like that. And I'm not sure why that is. Like, I really feel Giannis is, like, I think he's the second best player in the Eastern Conference. So I, I, I don't think that, I don't think, I don't think them being as, as I think they're the, what, the sixth seed or the seventh seed right now. I just think that's unacceptable. Yeah. Um, and like, I can't imagine how the Bucks owner feels. He like just went out and spent all this money on the team and, brought in Eric Bledsoe, and now, like, they're still not good. And the thing is, like, that their team is good. Like, Eric Bledsoe... No, it is. Chris like, they're just Middleton. not performing. Yeah, their team is so talented. Like, they have, like, Chris Middleton is, uh, like, Chris Middleton, no one talks about him, but he averages 20 points, 5 rebounds, 5 assists. He's a versatile, he's an amazing defender. Like, he, he's versatile, he can shoot, he can defend, he can score 20, he can give you 5 assists, he can, like... He is, he is one of those players that literally any NBA team would love to have. And, you know, for his position, he's a top, in my eyes, he's a top 10 player. So, like, and then Eric Bledsoe is one of a versatile point guard. He can defend. Giannis can defend. Like, defensively, they should be really good. And they have, you know, I, I, maybe it's because they don't have enough shooting because Chris Middleton, I think, is probably the best shooter in their lineup. And then, you know, they, they bring Jason Terry off the bench and stuff like that. But 
the books, I definitely think that they should be better. I'm not sure if they just have a, have a coaching issue with, or, but like whatever the, whatever the issue is, like they, they have been underachieving. I think it's, I think it's time to stop looking at them as a, like the Sixers, I think are a young team that have really showed signs that in the future, the Bucks have just been consistently average for the past, like since like 2015. So, yeah. I, I'm really hoping that they can step it up because I, I really just want to see Giannis do have a chance in the playoffs, and I was super disappointed with them and against in that series against the Raptors. I thought they had a real chance to win it, and they've got an even worse chance now. And I'm not looking forward to seeing them lose in the first round. Yeah, they're they're probably going to end up losing in the first round. Yeah, it would surprise me. Um, uh, I think who would they match up with? They probably match up with yeah, either like the Ra- Raptors or Celtics. Probably, I can't imagine they're going to be able to get a top four seed. Yeah, one moment, Ryan. Yeah. Do you want to go to Arizona or not? Sorry about that, Ryan. Yeah, don't worry about it. I'll just edit that out. Yeah. Okay. What were you saying? Uh, I'll give it a countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. But yeah, it, it's really interesting that the Bucks have just fallen apart. I really need to just do more research on why their defense has been suffering so much. And yeah, the 76ers have completely taken over that role of the young new team that's really hot in the East and looking over to take over when yeah, uh, LeBron's so gone. Fawn Maker... Uh, he was supposed to be better, I believe. Um, so, yeah, he, I, I don't think his development has really come along that well, but I, he should be pretty good in, in a few years. So, yeah, let me uh, take a look at how his defense has been this year. Yeah, probably pretty terrible, but we'll see. Uh, yeah, no, he hasn't been very good on defense, and he has his free point shooting. Uh, he's actually shooting better from free than Giannis, which is a bit telling, but. You know, I, yeah, Giannis, when he develops a jump shot, he'll be a player to to deal with. But as of right now, he's I think he's a little bit too predictable of threat because he always goes to the paint. Yep. Um, he nope. just needs to develop a few more a few more skills. Yeah, and that's one of the big differences between him and LeBron right now. That like beyond the fact that LeBron can shoot a free pointer, like he's also a lot bulkier, so he can really handle going to the paint all that much. And luckily, Giannis hasn't had any injuries. But you've got to think it's just a matter of time. Yeah, he's he's um I don't think like durability with LeBron is is not that is not something that an average NBA player can do. So yeah. Okay, so uh, do you want to go through some more teams or uh, switch uh, over to some uh, other topics? We can do either, either whatever's a, whatever you like. Okay, well I guess I'll uh, switch to some other topics. So uh, first of all, I I can't believe what Alfred Payton is doing with his hair. <laughs> It, oh, it's yeah, the most yeah. ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not sure what what is what is up with him. He's a good player, though. He's yeah, he's played ball so far. Strange. Yeah, I mean, he is. Uh, I don't know. Alfred Payton, I think is he, he's an he's been an underrated young player in the league. But I think his issue has always been the fact that he can't shoot either. Um, but just, I mean, in terms of a pure point guard, I think he's a pretty good player. I'm not sure what his averages are off the top of my head, but he, he's a good distributor of the ball. He can defend pretty well. Um, you know, he's probably the type of player that, you know, you could you could put him on a team with other stars and he'd be pretty good. Sort of like a Rondo situation from 2009, like in the Celtics. I think if you put Alfred Payton in a situation like that, he could really do well. Um, but, you yeah. know, he's, he's been wasting away his first few years in Orlando and now, now Phoenix. So Yeah, and obviously not nearly as good of a passer, but he's... He's a pretty good uh, ball handler, and like you can trust him with anything but shooting. 
Yeah, yeah, he uh, he does. He do, I think he, I'm not sure what his assist averages are off the top of my head, but I'll check real quick. I think I want to say he's been somewhere around eight, but um, like uh, but I'll check right now. Let's see, Alfred uh, Payton. Um, I've got seven point five. Yeah, for his career, he averages six and a half. But yeah, so you know, this season seven and a half. Yeah, in Phoenix so far, um, and you know. Even in Phoenix right now, it's only a sample size of eight games, but averaging about eight rebounds, seven, 17 points, eight, like if you round up, 17 points, eight assists, eight rebounds. Um, you know, so maybe Phoenix is a good situation for him. I think if he if he stays in Phoenix long term and he develops alongside Devin Booker, and uh, I think that could be a really good backcourt because you'd have one who can score and shoot and then one who can do everything else. Yeah. And like, that's really what, what they need right now. Their big men are doing all right. It's just their uh, guards cannot play defense at all yeah Devin Booker I don't think is a, is a great defender but you know if you have Alfred Payton in there and Devin Booker develops on defense and then you have Josh Jackson and then Alex Len and Marquise Chris um and then you get rid of Dragon Bender <laughs> then yeah poor guy uh, I think the Phoenix Phoenix is again we, we've talked about it before but Phoenix is one of those teams that in, the, in, a, few, in a couple of years will be very good yeah let's hope so we've been saying that for a couple of years now yeah honestly ever since Ever since Steve Nash has been gone. Yeah, so uh, we're, we're watching a game with a bunch of tankers in the league. Uh, what, what do you think about the issue of tanking? And like, Do you think it's something that the league really needs to take a take a hand on and like you know, try and eliminate it? No, I, I mean, I think it's a little bit overblown. I'm not really sure why Adam Silver gets so up in arms about it. Like, I mean... Yeah, it's it's not good. For, it's not fun to watch, and it, you know, it kind of sucks for the city that you know the team is in. But like at the same time, like like there there are only a handful of teams in the NBA that a lot of people really come to watch anyway. Like the Lakers, people come to watch the Celtics, the Cavs because of LeBron, the Heat because Miami, you know, and just big market situations. But like, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't really understand how you can prevent it either. Like. It's so obvious that, like, the Bulls are doing it, the Mavericks are doing it, the Hawks are doing it, the Suns are doing it, and, like, the Lakers obviously did it for a little while. Magic. Uh, The Magic, yeah. Like, you can't, you're never going to be able to stop it, so I don't understand why why you're making such a big issue about it. Like, teams are going to continue doing it. Um, So, I don't know, like, I I think it's, to be honest, it's a pretty good strategy. Like, (laughs) you know, you, you suck for a few years, you get some good picks, you develop them into good players, and you have a team. But I, I understand what Adam Silver is saying to a degree because for all these small market teams that end up tanking to get high draft picks, those high draft picks, if they develop into good players, there's a very good chance that they could just become really good and then leave to go somewhere else. So, you know, honestly, I, I feel like tanking would be less of an issue if there were just less teams in the NBA. Um, and, like, you know, that, that's kind of sad to say, but at the same like, I really don't think that 30 teams is necessary in the league because – you only really end up watching like 15 of them. So yeah. maybe if the league was like it was before when there were only 22 teams, um, tanking would be much less of an issue because I don't I don't believe it was that much of an issue back then when there were only 22 teams. So like, what's the point of having an NBA team in Orlando if you have a team in Miami? And what's the team of having? What's the point of having a team in Memphis when no one in Tennessee really even watches basketball? So you know. Yeah, and it's a good it's a good point because uh, I I feel like it's a much of a holdover from the times when the only way you could really watch the NBA was either get a national game, or you could go out to the actual game and see your team. But nowadays, you can just go online and either pirate a game or buy NBA League Pass, and like you can watch any game that you want. And like it's it's not realistic anymore to say if you don't have an NBA team like within seventy miles of your house, then you're never going to get to experience the product. That's just not the case anymore. Exactly. Like yeah, you can watch anything that you want. You can go online. You can find anything. You can watch anyone for free. Like, there's no point. I think to, like, it just the main thing for me is you. You like you can't stop it. Like, if a team wants to do it, then they're gonna do it. Like, they'll and no matter how much you find these owners who have like, yes, I understand that a six hundred thousand dollars is a hefty fine. But to Mark Cuban, that does not matter at all. So yeah. like, you know, they recently fined Mark Cuban six hundred thousand dollars for his public comments about tanking, but. Like, so, like, yeah, he'll pay it, and they're going to keep doing it, and that's it. And there's nothing you can do about it. Like, so I, I don't I don't really think it's that much of an issue because the NBA, in my opinion, is still very watchable. Oh, yeah. Because you, you watch it. Like, you, you don't even, like, 
the only people who would really care about like this situation are the fans of tanking teams. Yes. And you know, like I remember like a few, like, yeah, Lakers fans were upset for like two years, but now they're happy because they have a good young core. So, you know, yeah. And like, those aren't the kinds of fans that you really want to be appealing to. Like you want to, this is a problem in all sports leagues right now, but you really need to be appealing to your base and not like trying to appeal to uh, Joe Schmo who tunes into a couple NBA games every season and then maybe watches the finals. Like that's yeah. not your market. Yeah. Like there are so many people who really enjoy watching the league like overall. So like, I think most people will understand tanking like at all NBA, like all, all fans who like really follow the NBA, like, you know, they understand tanking and like, while it sucks, like you cannot argue with with results, and it's worked very well for Philadelphia. It's worked well for Los Angeles. Um, you know, hopefully it'll end up working well for the Mavericks. Uh, they got Dennis Smith Jr. as their first real, you know, tanking pick. Yeah, and the, they're going to get another one this year. And you know, if they can get a really good player like DeAndre Ayton or you know someone like that to pair with Dennis Smith Jr., then there's really nothing you can say about it because it works. And at the end of the day, I feel like. The, it, it's a star-driven league anyway, and if you're acquiring more stars for more teams, then in a few years, then you're going to have way more money. Like, because if, if you think about it this way, like in three three years from now, like <laughs> three years from now, you know, Steph Curry will still be 32, Durant will be 32, Westbrook will be 32. Like all these players, you know, they might not be as explosive as they are, but they're still going to be star-caliber players because, you know, in my opinion, a player doesn't really leave their prime until they're like 35, 36 usually. So you know, sometimes earlier, depending on like, you know, the wear and tear. So Westbrook might you know, fade a little bit sooner than that. But like these players are all going to be really good in a few years anyway. And if you have all of these good players who are still really good and then you have them in like they're playing simultaneously, like while all these young stars are starting to get really good, then you're in a really good situation in the league. Like, you know, from a front office standpoint, because then all your teams are generating revenue because like, let's say Dallas gets Dennis. Smith, they have Dennis Smith Jr. right now. So let's say he develops into a point guard who averages like, you know, 22, 23 points per game and like six, seven assists or something like that. And he's a really good player. And then, okay, so then he's really good. And then let's say they draft DeAndre Aiden this year. Then that team's going to be really good in three or four years because they're going to have two really good players. And then the Kings are going to be really good because they tanked and they got De'Aaron Fox and they got the Colley Stein and they got all these other players. Well, I don't so know about all the these Kings, small market but... teams like Sacramento, Dallas, you know, all these other teams are going to be good. And then. At the end of the day, it's better for the league to have a lot of good teams and a few good teams because if you have a lot of good teams and you have a lot of people tuning in to watch those good teams, then you make more money. So yeah, and like part of the problem with and like why tanking is becoming such a problem recently is because it's more and more becoming a, t a league where there isn't a lot of parity. Like all, there will be like one or two teams that you could really even say are like mediocre and like are fighting for the number eight seed, and then everyone else is either like in the top four in the conference, you got your uh, Warriors, your your Rockets, you know, so the Hornets, <laughs> the Timberwolves, the Spurs, and then in the East, you got the Raptors, Celtics, Cavs, and then the Wizards, and then, like, everyone else is, like, either trying to decide if they're about to tank or uh, trying to invest in, like, a final push, and, like, it, it's it's a weird thing, and, like, it's always been the case that way in the league, not necessarily with so many tanking, where, like, you have eight teams uh, at least a couple days ago within uh, two and a half uh, games of the fi of the last seed and yeah like it's always been the case like in the 90s you look at it, you see the bu the bulls where they were the presumptive favorites every year like that was just something you accepted you had the lakers in the early 2000s lakers again in the late 80s or celtics in the early 80s and like it's just ever since the really the nba got big like it's been a superstar league and you have to you have to get bad to get good, unfortunately. And uh, that was going to delve into something I was interested to hear and what you thought on uh, One of Adam Silver's tactics for dealing with tanking has been to uh, change around the draft lottery stuff. Uh, do you think it would help if they had like a flat lottery uh, lottery percentages where everyone w had the same odds? Um, like every team, I, not in the playoffs. I think that would be more like, I think that would be completely unfair <laughs> because if you have a situation like like if you're if you're the Golden State Warriors and you end up getting the number one pick, right? Like let's just say like if every team has the same odds. Well every Golden every non playoff team, I meant. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Well, okay, well still. Like let's let's go back to uh, two thousand fifteen then if that's your example, right? So in two thousand fifteen the Oklahoma City Thunder didn't make the playoffs. But 
they had, you know, Russell Westbrook and Kevin Durant. So they missed the playoffs um, and then it ended up being New Orleans as the eighth seed in the West. And the Thunder got the 14th pick because, you know, they were the best lottery team. So if you were to take a situation like that, right, if something like that happens and then Oklahoma City ends up getting the number one pick in the draft, and then Oklahoma City is put in such an amazing position where they can trade this number one pick to a tanking team that has a good player that wants to rebuild. Like, for example, right, like in let's say that if this system that Adam Silver is talking about, like a flat lottery, was in place in 2016 uh, or two, no, 2015. Um, in that draft, right, let's say that Indiana knew that they that Paul George didn't want to stay there long term. Like, let's say that they knew that then. Um, and this is when Paul George, he was coming back from the injury this season. Yeah. So his next season, 2015-16, was his first full season back. Let's say that Oklahoma City had put a package together at that point to send the number one pick and a few role players to Indiana for Paul George, and then you had Russell Westbrook, Kevin Durant, and Paul George. At that time, in, in two, entering 2016, that would have been supremely, like that would have been amazing to see that happen. So I think it would put, if you were to do the flat lottery system, then I think it would put some teams in an advantage because even if you look at a team like the 2016 Chicago Bulls, who barely missed the playoffs, if you know if you gave a 41 win team the number one pick, they can just trade that pick for a good player for something else that they want, and then it would end up you know it would just end up creating more of a problem where you have more bad teams who just keep tanking. Um, like and at the same like also though like I, I feel like it, it's sort of unfair if you eliminate tanking because all these teams that don't have a chance to sign a star player through free agency. Like tanking is really their only way to acquire star players. And then at best, they can only keep these star players for like four, you know, five years. So, you know, assuming that they extend them on their rookie contract, I just don't think that it would be fair to all these, you know, smaller market teams in the NBA if you had a flat flat lottery because they have like, it's not like anyone is ever going to want to sign with the Memphis Grizzlies in free agency, unless you're Chandler Parsons and you want <laughs> to make money. Yeah. And like the flat lottery, the history of that just goes back to uh, the uh, early 80s, I believe, where they had the whole envelope system where you, could, you know, it was just drawn from the envelope as one of each team and they get picks. And then, you know, uh, Julius Irving, uh, not Irving, uh, what, Patrick, Patrick Ewing just goes to the Knicks on some uh, corrupt thing. But yeah, like it's it's a weird system. And I, I while I disagree with you and think that it would help tanking a lot because you wouldn't have any reason to uh, try and be as bad as some of these teams have been, like where they're not starting, they're true starters in favor of just like young players. And like they can go for the number 14 seed reasonably, with, not number 14, like the first seed out of the playoffs reasonably without having to worry about what effect that's going to have in their future. But really the system that I... I've been hearing about and like one that I think would work a lot better. This was from uh, the lab, that podcast I was talking about earlier is, is a system where all of the draft picks come into M the NBA just inter in a free agency system. And then uh, every that I think is also a very good idea because, and just to clarify, I don't disagree with you. I, I agree with you in the sense that it would, it would mitigate tanking. Like it would, it would make it stop because more teams would like, it probably would help it stop i just don't think that it would solve the problem like, yeah like like it just it, it only it hampers would, it would, you know most teams would go for it but that's what i was saying when i was like it's unfair because then this the teams that won't get the number that like teams that are too mediocre to get the to be in the playoffs but too mediocre to get a top pick would just sort of be stuck in irrelevancy for a long time but yeah if you had them all enter as free agents i think it's a very good idea because that way you also don't have this thing where like you have so, like I, I find it strange that you have a draft of 60 players and then for the next 10 years, only five of them really mean anything. Oh, like, actually, hang on a second. Let me clarify something. So they're not going to be true free agents. How it would work is just whichever team bids the most money on that player, they have to go to that team. So like if somebody doesn't want to go to, as you said, like the Memphis Grizzlies, but the Grizzlies give the most money, you're going to the Grizzlies, buddy. Oh, okay. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. But at the same time, though, if, if that were to happen, though, I think that you would have to put a qualification that you can only do it with lottery teams because right now I think the like um, Philadelphia is a team that has a lot of like they're they're one of the teams with the most cap space. So if they could sign like a really good young player, even though that they're already primed to make the playoffs, I think that could be a little bit unfair. Well, isn't that um, to their credit that they've done such well, it's such good management, and they have that much cap room for them? It is, it is to their credit, but at the same time, just from a like a competition standpoint, I think it would be a little. It would. It, I don't think 
basically, I think the, the problem, the thing that I think that one of the draft's best purposes, I think, is that the draft helps, you know, add parity to the league, like, because you're making worse teams, you're making teams that are bad, you're making them better, so that in the future that there has a chance to be more competition, you know, which is, you know, it's basically the reason why we look at the future of the NBA and we think that it's really bright because, like, you have the Knicks with Chris Stapps Porzingis, you have the Suns with Devin Booker, you have the the Timberwolves with Carl Anthony Towns and Andrew Wiggins, you have the Sixers with Joel Embiid, you have the Bucks with, you know, Giannis Antetokounmpo. I think if you didn't have a draft where these teams get to select players like that and it was just based on which team manages their finances the best, then it would always just come down to which team has the best management in terms of their salaries. And, you know, then there, there are some teams like the Sacramento Kings and the Brooklyn Nets who are just horrible in the front office. And then if their team, like, I'm not saying that those teams need to be, like, rewarded. Like, those teams, in my eyes, really, like, they, they should serve some sort of penalty for being so, like, you know, incompetent and stuff like that. But just in terms of having a 30-team league, like, in terms of fairness, like, it just wouldn't be fair to those teams. Yeah, and like in, just in terms of the Nets, it's uh, becoming really interesting because they're finally coming off of the Propoyo of uh, you know, terrible decision era where he just invested all of his uh, draft picks and his. Uh, sorry, uh, you, you'll see why I paused in a second. Like the Hawks mascot just started like eating one of the people, but uh, yeah, it, it, that's when kiss cams go wrong, people. But uh, yeah, basically the. I, I think it helps a lot because usually you see with all good teams like they're going to be pretty capped out and like if they're not that's really a credit to their GM and like I feel like all sports leagues right now they're moving more and more towards you got to have a great GM you got to have great ownership you got to really uh, manage just like business and do a great job and like as much as you can I feel like you need to uh, prioritize that but may maybe a system where I, the priority goes to uh, lottery picks first should happen but who knows. Yeah, and also like the like like I was saying earlier, like the one thing about the draft that I, I I've never really liked is that like you only have one like a dra a draft will only be like like we can we look at drafts like two thousand three right and we say that it was one of the best drafts of all time. Yeah, that draft only had four really good players, <laughs> mm -hmm. like you know like four star players like like what like four out of sixty like really that's your standard for <laughs> like one out of like. <laughs> that really like that that's the standard for being like a really good draft like and then you have drafts like 2000 where there are literally like no memorable players who come out of it and like yeah i just think that the i i think it would make the most sense if you could just really like players who players who forego their college eligibility like they should be allowed to have meetings with teams just like a free agent would get to like you know, obviously, like, when Kevin Durant was a free agent, he got, like, he got to choose. Like, he was like, okay, I'm going to meet with Boston, I'm going to meet with Miami, I'm going to meet with Golden State, I'm going to meet with Oklahoma City. And, you know, it should be like that. Like, teams that need help and want young players should generate interest. Like, they should reach out to the player that they want to recruit, and they should just bring him in, and then he gets to make a decision. Because, like, I get what you're saying in the sense of, like, you know, whoever has the most money pays them, and then he gets yeah. to play for them. But... I feel like that could lead to some unhappiness with some players because, like, in the draft, I think it's sort of understood, like, oh, you know, like... Well, here, how about, how about this? How about they can go back to college if they if they don't like it? Yeah, like, that, that I think is fine, too, because another situation that I've seen is, like, I think they changed this rule, but I think a few years ago, it was such that if you foregoed your... Like, if you... I guess I'm not sure what past tense of forego would be foregone. Like, if you gave up your college eligibility, basically, and then you didn't get drafted, then you couldn't go back. I think yeah. they changed that. I, I think but, that's actually still the case, but maybe no, I'm wrong. Yeah, that is, and that's, that sucks. Yeah, but, that should yeah, be gone, like, obviously. You should, you should be able to go back to college and then just try your luck again if you're, you know, if you if you don't sign in free agency. Like, it should be like a system where you get to sign, like, you get to be a free agent, you get to get recruited by other teams, but then, like, if you don't, end up signing with those teams and you don't like, you know, if you don't, if you, you yeah, then, your, your then it's not to your penalty. Yeah. Like if you get, if you get, uh, if you get recruited by four teams, then your fifth option should be to just stay in college and not take any of the offers. But like, I don't know. I, I just think they really do need to figure something out in terms of how they're bringing new players into the league, because I just don't think that it's really, it's really working because like you end up getting like, you, you, you pick 60 players 
the entire all the players in the second like you only really ever get like maybe one or two players who are good out of the second round that are really like nba level players anyway oh yeah everyone else is just like a bunch of like scrubs and then you just have your first round players who just make up the nba body like the the player like for a number of years and then you only have a few that are really good so i think i guess that makes sense though because like at the, like the draft you bring in 60 players a year so you just bring in a bunch of bodies to make it so that you have players in the in the in the in the league basically but i don't know whatever it is that the league just they just need to figure something out to make it more cohesive and smooth yeah but, and my biggest thing with the highest better is just to avoid a situation where everyone is going to like the Celtics or the Lakers because it's the best option but an interesting point yeah. with that would be, uh, do you think each team would still only get to uh, sign two players, or should they just be able to sign as many as they want? So you're talking about, like, in terms of the salary cap? Uh, well, yeah, like, in terms of the system that we have, uh, that not we have, that, like, this system that we're talking about, where, like, you can sign, like, to the highest bidder, should you only be able to get two players in total still? Like, you keep the 60-player thing? Yeah, I don't think that. Yeah, I, I feel like if in every. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I would, I would, I wouldn't let you sign multiple players. I wouldn't allow them to sign multiple players simply because, um, like if you're if you're a team like Los Angeles right now who has the most cap room out of anyone with, yeah. I think I'm not sure how much money they have free cap space, but like I'll check. They could sign like I, I feel I want to guess like 170 million something like that, because I think Magic Johnson said something about how they have room for like two max slots so if you're signing rookies you could sign like four really good rookies to like half a max <laughs> and then you would just be stacked for the future uh, let's see Ooh, that's a lot uh yeah it looks like they have like 50 million in cap space which is crazy yeah yep they are uh yeah the lakers are they're they're, they're gonna be interesting this coming free agency whether or not they actually do anything so yeah uh, and uh, just to uh, wrap up this whole uh, draft thing, uh, you would want to get rid of the uh, one and done rule, right? Like you can just come back and come into oh, yes. NBA. Yes, the one and done rule to me is really dumb. It's so dumb. Okay, yeah, I don't think we need to say more on that. So uh, I guess we can talk about uh, the LeBron free agency that's coming up. That's always an interesting topic. Uh, where, where do you think he's going to go? Not the Lakers? I don't think he's going to go to the Lakers. I think um, as a. Uh, I really don't know where I think he's going to go because um, a lot of people think that he's going to stay in Cleveland um, no. now after the after the moves of the deadline. I don't think he will. No I don't chance. think he should because I, uh, the fact is I just don't think they're going to win a championship this year. Um, and if there, if LeBron re-signed on a team where he's lost two consecutive finals, then it's it's really a quite like why like there's. He always talks about how his main goal is to win championships, and to me, there's only three places that he could really go where he could. There, there, to me, there are three teams he could go to where he would actually be able to contend for a championship without joining Golden State, <laughs> which that would obviously be awful. Yeah. But um, I think there's San Antonio, there's Houston, and then there's Philadelphia. So I would personally love to see him in, uh, in uh, San Antonio because uh, LeBron James, I think, is compared, he's compared to all these other players like Michael Jordan and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, all these other players, all these, you know, Hall of Fame, you know, greatest of all time caliber players. But all these players, and oh, Kobe Bryant, I forgot to mention Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal. They all played for great coaches. Like, you know, obviously they all had Phil Jackson. Tim Duncan had Greg Popovich. You know, even Bill Russell had Red Auerbach when he was doing everything that he was doing. And LeBron James has never played for a really, 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 really fantastic coach like all these other players have like gotten. Like, Spolstra is really good, but he's not in the same caliber. Yeah, exactly. Like, Eric Spolstra is a great coach, but he's not hes not a Pantheon coach like Greg Popovich is, who's been the best coach in the league for the past 20 years. So, um, I think if he played with Greg Popovich, I think he would be doing himself a really good... Like, I think he'd be doing a lot for himself, because I believe that if LeBron James had played his whole career with the Spurs, he would... Obviously, you, I feel like he'd probably have like six championships. Um, yeah. Because, you know, what Popovich was able to do with the cast of a bunch of old players who were past their prime and one up and coming player who really wasn't even that great then, that being Kawhi Leonard in 2014. Kawhi Leonard was averaging like 16 points per game and he won finals MVP. Like, oh, yeah. So if he had a player like LeBron James for this long, I really think that 
um, you know, he would have won a lot more championships. So I think that if he goes to San Antonio, he'd be really well equipped because in terms of a basketball fit, I just think it'd be great because uh, LeBron is, I think, known around the league, you know, to, to demand a lot out of his teammates. He said that himself. He was like, I demand a lot from my teammates. But Greg Popovich would demand a lot on his, like, he, LeBron would have to do a lot less, I think, with Popovich around because LeBron wouldn't have to motivate them to be in the right spots. He wouldn't have to anchor the defense. And, like, he wouldn't have to be such a, he wouldn't have to do nearly as much because all the players who played for the Spurs already know to do all of those things. And then obviously he'd be playing with Kawhi Leonard and LaMarcus Aldridge. And the Spurs are always competing for a championship. Like they're always among the top teams in the NBA, despite not having any superstars, um, you know, depending on how you view LaMarcus Aldridge this season. But like if you had LeBron, then obviously you just, and Greg Popovich and the Spurs are the best team in terms of taking care of older players. And, you know, Tim Duncan won a championship when he was way past his prime. And, you know, obviously if LeBron stays there, he could stay with Kawhi. The Spurs system could really just help him and just allow him to have a really easy last few years of his career, which I think could be really good. And he could probably win like two more championships on his way out if he goes to San Antonio. Yeah. And like that would definitely keep Popovich in the league, which would be amazing. Yeah. yeah. Seeing Popovich retire would be very sad at this point. But moving on to Houston, I said San Antonio, Houston, Philadelphia. Houston, I think the biggest issue with them is that um, I've seen this brought up a few times is that if he ended up going to uh, the Rockets, then they would probably have to decimate their bench yeah. because in order to sign him. But I think if you were to, um, you know, either convince LeBron to take less money, which I don't think he should, but it, it depends how much he really wants to win these championships because or you might not even have to do that. So Chris Paul, I think, is he's a free agent this summer because he opted into his player option before he got traded. It was a sign and trade. So if Chris Paul, uh, he's a free agent this season. If Chris Paul takes less money for them to sign LeBron James, then obviously he could go there. They could keep some of their bench players. Maybe get rid of one player. Um, if you know, I would get rid of Ryan Anderson. See what see what I can do about that because his contract is horrendous. But. Uh, and then him being there would be really helpful, I think, because it would sort of give the Rockets, because just on paper right now, the Rockets don't stack up to Golden State because, you know, I think James Harden and Chris Paul is still overall, like, even though they're both very good, they're not the same as Clay Thompson, Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, and Draymond Green. Um, and if you give, you know, if you put LeBron on that team, then you really do give sort of a matchup because I think Golden State's, big, I mean, Houston's biggest issue, I think, this year with Golden State will not, like, if this was Golden State from two years ago when it was when Durant was not there, I think this would be extremely compelling because you would have a battle of like probably the two best backcourts in the NBA. But now that the Warriors have Kevin Durant, Kevin Durant is sort of going to be like he's going to be unmatched against Houston. Like there's not going to be anyone uh, at that position like when he's playing Houston that'll really be able to match him or stop him or anything like that. Oh yeah. But if you have LeBron, uh, LeBron, I'm not going to say LeBron can stop him, but LeBron can, can down. Match him. Uh, LeBron can match him in terms of just how many how many points he scores and everything like that. So yeah. if if he went there, then I think he could work out really well. LeBron obviously plays extremely well in a system filled with shooters. Um, it'd be interesting to see how it works though with LeBron and Harden because uh, if you add a third ball hand, I, I think Le, wherever LeBron goes, I think LeBron would be best served if he sort of transitioned his game a little bit towards being more of a scorer rather than a facilitator. Like maybe he could average like. Like maybe you could just try and average like 28 points a game and just average like maybe five assists instead of needing to be such a facilitator. Because if you think about LeBron as just a, like if you made LeBron just like a cutter, like a slasher, like where he just, his only goal is to score. Like I really think he could probably average somewhere close to 30 points per game just because he's, he's so big and it's so difficult to stop him Yeah. and his speed and his athleticism still, you know, if he just transitioned into a score, he could, he could score really well. And then, you know, obviously that would help his, his case for greatest player of all time because they would probably put him closer to Patterson Kareem for all-time leading scorer. But, yeah. Uh, and then Philadelphia was the last team I mentioned. I think Philadelphia would just be a compelling fit because uh, they're a young, up-and-coming team, and LeBron can pro they can probably win like a championship or two with LeBron in his prime. Uh, or not in his prime, but while LeBron is still really good. And then if LeBron chooses to play a couple extra years, you obviously have Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons. And uh, who might be able to just and Markel Fultz if that's even still a thing, <laughs> but who can you know maybe they can get LeBron to a few finals uh, in his later years, um, 
But in terms of legacy, I think it would probably be best to move to the West because every time you come out of the Western Conference, you're probably going to win the championship if you're LeBron. Whereas if you're in the East, you would just keep stacking up finals losses. Um, and some people view that differently. Some people will say, oh, like as long as, like, okay, yeah, but some people think that it's better for him to get there more times and lose than it is for him to get there fewer times and win. But, you know, he's already, he this season, if he makes it, he's already going to have done it eight straight times. I don't really think that there's any need for him to have to say he made it 10 straight times or anything like that. So Yeah, like it's a marginal no gain at this point. And uh, right now, do you want to uh, put a pause in that to uh, take a look at the top 10 plays of the week and see uh, which we think is really the best? That could be interesting. Sure. Yeah, let's go ahead. Okay, so uh, right now I'm watching one where it looks like Corford just pulled off like the greatest shot I've ever seen him do in his life, which is pretty good. Uh, uh, is this thing this streaming right? Oh no, never mind. Uh, okay, you know actually maybe I'll just come back to that in like uh, a minute or so when uh, we we're both caught up through the whole thing. Just let me know when you're you saw the number one play. So on the LeBron situation. I just went through the salary caps for teams, and uh, the 76ers have like 17 million below the cap right now, so they're in a great position, and then the Rockets and Spurs are basically at the same place. But yeah, I, I don't think he'll go to the Rockets ultimately. I feel like it, he almost views that as too easy, which is something that he seems to take into account when he is moving around the league. And uh, Spurs, I would absolutely love to see it, but it's ultimately going to come down to if he wants to go to the West or stay in the East. and. I really think he's going to stay in the East. And uh, I was trying to figure out like who are the sleeper teams that might get him. Uh, the Pelicans would be a really interesting one to see him go to if they can keep DeMarcus Cousins. Yeah, because the front court would be unstoppable. Oh, yeah. And then uh, there was one other team that I saw. Uh, where was it? Uh, da, 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 da. Ah, maybe I didn't have anything else. But yeah, like the, those are really the four big teams, and like there's no way that he's going to go to the Celtics or Raptors or anyone better than like the Spurs right now. Yeah, I thought I, the the Bucks was interesting because I know Giannis said that he was going to try and recoup LeBron this. Yeah, summer. that's not happening. Yeah, I don't think he would ever play in Milwaukee. So yeah, I and I, some people have brought up Miami. I I I was thinking Miami too, but I don't think he'll go back. Uh, I don't think he should really. It, it just sort it'd of, be too weird. Yeah, and it's like why? Like, there's just no point. Like, yeah, you uh, probably wouldn't win championships there. So, yeah. So you're through for hey, you're through with the top ten. Uh, I just saw the one about Aaron Baines. Oh wow, you're far behind than I thought. Yeah. Uh, okay, I thought you were only thirty seconds behind. I'll just give me a signal when you're through that. Um, oh, number, was number one the Larry Nance play? Yeah. Yeah, I just saw that one. Oh my bad. I was thinking of the other Celtics play. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it just ended. So, uh, I think that's a deserving number one. I think Larry Nance, <laughs> I thought that was pretty pretty amazing. He was better than his dunk contest performance. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, I didn't see Harden play on here, but I think Harden's ankle breaker was the best play this week. Yeah, it's sure. certainly the most intimidating. Actually, no, you, did you see that LeBron pass? Oh, the LeBron thing between Tristan Thompson? Yeah, that Thompson. was incredible. Yeah, uh, yeah. the I, only reason that I... The only reason that I would put Harden's above that one is because LeBron admitted that that bit wasn't intentional. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, in in order this week, I would put Harden's ankle breaker number one on Wesley Johnson, uh, just because he waited so long that. Uh, oh yeah, like he, was, he was really was reveling in it. Play. Yeah, <laughs> and then he he shot it basically like he got another defender in the play and you know made it through a through a late contest. Um, and then LeBron's nutmeg of Tristan Thompson behind the back dribble. That was that was amazing to watch. And then three, I would put Larry Nance's play. Um, oh, and uh, another another sleeper play. Um, I saw Dwayne Wade was playing against uh, the Lakers, and he he did he was like in the post, and Lonzo Ball was guarding him, and he did like he did like the craziest fadeaway, like, and he was he basically he fell out of bounds after, and he made the shot over the backboard. That was that was pretty cool. Yeah, over the upset Lakers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know what's going on with him lately, but he, I literally had to watch the LeBron play like six times before I could even figure out what was going on. Yeah, it was it was crazy. Like I, I didn't really. That it should have been a turnover, but yeah, it know, should. It, it whatever. Like I mean, it happened, and he 
it was cool though. Like it was, it was fun to watch. That's for sure. Yeah, and like that's the great thing about LeBron. He he's always making those great plays. Like last year, you had that incredible pass like across the baseline where I, I, I it had like a specific name for the play, like Hammer or something. Like he just is running down the baseline, he just throws it as hard as he can across the court to Kevin Love for a free. Yeah, like, yeah, he 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 does have some pretty good plays every year. Um, and if you remember uh, in the finals this this year in the twenty seventeen finals, he uh, he threw a lob off the backboard to himself. Yeah. Like he was, he was stuck in the lane and he was, he didn't know where to go. So he like, he threw it at the backboard and then he dunked on Tristan Thompson. Yeah. LeBron, LeBron is, he's, I think he's a little bit underrated in the aspect that he used a lot of memorable plays. Yeah, definitely. Like uh, I think at the end of his career, when you make a compilation of like all the, all the sweet plays from his career, like he's, he's going to have a pretty extensive one. <laughs> yeah. Do you think he's passed Michael yet? In terms of what? I right, just in terms of uh, having a better career. Well, actually, how how would you define that? Like, how do you how do you well, define like your greatest okay, of all time? This is, this is something that I, I've I've discussed this quite a lot actually, and just I've watched a lot on it. I've thought a lot about it, and like I think the one like first, I don't think rings alone. I don't think championships alone can measure how great of a player you are because Robert Ory has seven, and you know, Bill Russell has 11, but no one thinks Bill Russell is the greatest player of all time. Kareem has six and six MVPs, but no one thinks that he's better than Michael Jordan. Or some people do, but not that many people think he's better than Michael Jordan. Um, I think to be the greatest player of all time, you need, you, need, you need a very strong combination of success and statistics. So my, the reason that Michael Jordan, I think, is seen as the greatest player of all time in so many people's eyes is because he has done like he he was the closest thing to where we saw an amazing like amazing statistics and an amazing impact on the league as well as amazing success however i think that like so so to preface i do think michael jordan as of right now i think he does stand as the greatest player ever simply because when you look when you compare him at a surface level to lebron lebron has the one instance in the 2011 finals where he just sort of disappeared and he did not have a series, but he didn't, he did not have the series that he should have had. I think that he, th- I think that that series was made for him to step up and take and close the deal. And like, just like, there's my first championship, but because he didn't do that, I think that's ultimately like a, uh, a dark, a dark spot on his legacy, because I think people were saying that, uh, you know, like <laughs> if you watch some of the commentaries from it, some of the announcers were saying things like, he's really got to step up and guard Jason Terry and Jason Terry at the time was like, he was old and not the player that he used to be. And he was a tiny point guard and LeBron is six, eight. So I think that just in terms of a recency, like bias right now, I don't think that LeBron is the greatest, but I think when it's all said and done, when LeBron retires, uh, if he wins, you know, let's say two more championships and then he'll probably end up as the all time leading scorer. He's probably going to end up with 10,000 assists and 10,000 rebounds. Um, and I think when it's done, I think LeBron will be seen as the greatest player of all time. But as of right now, I don't think he is simply because his success, like while I I don't think you can hold the, the finals losses, I don't think you can hold against LeBron are the 2007 NBA finals loss, uh, when he was in his fourth year, because he was just playing a superior Spurs team. Yeah. I don't think you can hold the 2017 loss against him because the Warriors just had four hall of famers and there was nothing he could do. He, he played so well, he averaged a triple-double, and still nothing happened. But I do think LeBron should have won in 2015. I know that Kawhi, I know that Kyrie Irving and Kevin Love were injured, but at the same time, he had a two he had a 2-1 lead heading back to Cleveland, and then he lost three straight games. Yeah, and the I Warriors weren't, they weren't crazy good at that point. Yeah, and, you know, the Warriors, they were good, but they weren't amazing yet. So, um for that, so I think he definitely should have won the championship in 2011 and 2015. So he should already have five rings, and this conversation should be about, like, is he going to get seven rather than is he going to get five? Yeah. Um, so for those reasons, I don't think right now he is, but I think when it's over, I think he will be. I love LeBron James. I think that he he does receive, I think, a lot of unnecessary criticism for being a choker and stuff like that. And, you know, while I will admit he has had some moments where he, he showed up smaller, like, there's there are plays where he did so such phenomenal things that people never even talk about. Like 
the 2009 series against the Magic where he hit the game winner at the buzzer. Then in Game 7 of 2013, everyone talks about how Ray Allen saved his legacy, but no one will ever talk about the jumper on the on the very possession before to give Miami, like to put to, to tie the game to even get a chance of sending it to overtime. Yeah. Like LeBron hit the three before that on the possession before, and then in Game 7, LeBron, everyone everyone else was tired and not playing well and playing awful, and LeBron had a great game in Game 7. He had a, I think he had a triple-double. No, 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 that was 2016, but... In 2013, he hit a clutch jumper to seal the game, to seal the championship, really, with 29 seconds left. Um, the score was 88-90. to 90. Miami was leading. There were 27 seconds left. LeBron James hit a 19-foot jump shot, and then that gave them a four-point lead, which basically sealed the championship because at that point, even when San Antonio got the ball back, the most they could get was three, and then they would have to play the foul game the rest of the way. So, you know, he, I think, is... is uh, and his field goal percentage is better than Kobe, Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan's in uh, clutch situations. And he's also, his elimination game stats are also better than both of theirs. So he, he is, I think, hated on a little bit too much for, you know, disappearing in the clutch moments. But he just, um, as of right now, I just don't think that the media and like, I don't think anyone's going to let you forget all the, the moments where he should have, you know, done something. Because when you compare him to Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan has never had any of those moments. Like, Michael Jordan never had one of those. I, I, I mean, I won't say he never had those moments, but he doesn't have any of those moments that people scrutinize or talk about anymore because, you know, no one no one will ever tell you that Michael Jordan, no one will tell you that he, about 1995, when he lost to uh, Shaquille O'Neal's Magic, when yeah. Shaquille O'Neal was only a third-year player. Like, no one will tell you about that. No one will tell you about how the first two times he made the playoffs, they had losing records. Uh, no one will tell you about the fact that it took him, what, the 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90 it took him six years to get to the nba finals um and win a championship whereas it took lebron four to get to his first nba finals and like how it took until like all all of the great teams of that era started getting old and decrepit for him to really yeah exactly like no one will tell you about how like he had to look like jordan was never that like he he was really good but he never beat the celtics dynasty like he never beat the bad boy pistons he just waited until they were old and couldn't weren't as good and then his first championship he played against the the end of the showtime lakers when magic johnson was barely magic johnson anymore and then you know he played against utah teams you know that were good then he played against i think did he play a blazers team yes uh, he played like the drexler led a blazers yeah, team know, right before he retired Cole as well like when you look at the level of competition between the teams that michael jordan faced in the nba finals and the teams that lebron james has faced in the nba finals not even close I'm, yeah, LeBron James has faced 26 Hall of Famers. <laughs> and, you know, that's, you know, like Harden and Westbrook and Durant, like all those players, like we assume that they will be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. So, like, he's played 26 caliber players like that, and Michael Jordan only ever played nine. Mm-hmm. So, I think that people should account for that a little bit more when they're talking about who is better. Um, and they need to analyze more about how Michael Jordan, like, they need to talk more about how he never made it out of the first round without Scotty Pippen. They need to talk more about uh, the fact that the Bulls only won two less games when he retired the first time they need to talk about how Scottie Pippen was an MVP. I think Scottie Pippen finished second or third in MVP voting the first year without Michael Jordan. They won 55 games and the year when Jordan was there, they won 57. Um, they need to talk about how there was a blown call by a referee that prevented the Bulls from getting to a finals that year. It was like a, there was a Scottie Pippen play where something happened in game seven against New York. And if the call had went their way, then they would have won the series and, you know, they would have went to the finals. So, People need to just analyze a little bit more about, like LeBron, I think definitely does add more value because when LeBron leaves a team, they'll go from winning 60 games to winning 20 games. Yeah. But when Jordan leaves, you know, this a team, and that's the main uh, thing that I have with that is like, you know, when he left Cleveland the first time, they went from being in the in the conference finals to being in to having the first pick in the draft. So LeBron, I think, is a more valuable player. He's a more versatile player. Um, but as of right now, just in terms of his resume, like statistically, he will end up being a better player than Michael Jordan, just in terms of the total numbers. And, you know, he's like, he's not that much worse of a scorer, but he's a better passer and he's a better rebounder. Um, he's a better shot blocker. Better. Uh, well, now they're about the same on defense. See, here's the thing that I always say about their defense is that Michael Jordan, I think, was probably a better individual one-on-one defender. Yeah, good point. But LeBron James is easily the better versatile. Like he's, a, he's much more versatile defensively yeah that's a better way of Um, thinking about it yeah because lebron is lebron is a six eight small forward but he lebron has 
always been able, or when, not anymore, I guess, but when he was in his prime, LeBron James was able to consistently and like properly defend players who were a lot bigger than him and players who were a lot smaller than him. Because um, I remember there were some clips uh, in, of, of some Laker games that they played when he was in Miami where he was really, really like, he was he was completely shutting Pau Gasol out of plays, and that was when Pau Gasol was very good. And then obviously he would take uh, one-on-one matches with Kevin Durant, Kobe Bryant, players like that. Um, and the one year, uh, there was a year where Mark Gasol won Defensive Player of the Year, and I think you know most NBA media members acknowledge that that was that was a huge huge mistake, and that LeBron should have been the Defensive Player of the Year that year. Um, cause that was also the same year where he, uh, he was one vote away from being unanimous MVP. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot about that. that. Yeah. There was one guy that voted for Carmelo Anthony. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, LeBron James finished second in the MV- in the defensive player of the year voting that year. But that was a year where he was in all honesty. I, I truly believe he was robbed that year. I think that award was his, but I think just because of the voting voter fatigue and stuff, people didn't want to give LeBron another award because that was, that was his fourth MVP in five years. Yeah. <laughs> So I don't think they wanted to give him something else, but uh, yeah, I just overall, I think LeBron is in, in terms of how you, like how you play the game of basketball. Like I really do think LeBron is a better player, like, cause he's a more efficient player. He's a more efficient scorer. He scores almost as many points per game. He's shot like, you know, he, he's just, he's been able to play for longer. He's been able to play in multiple settings. He's been able to play with rule changes. He, you know, because he, I think, I think it was LeBron's first season. He was able to play with hand checking, and he averaged twenty-two points a game, six assists, six rebounds. And then, you know, obviously, when they removed the rule, he played a little bit better. But he showed that he could obviously still play with it. Um, and some people always say that Michael Jordan, like some people, like to say that, oh, you know, the league was much more physical, so Michael Jordan's obviously better on the rim. But the type of deep, like again, people don't bring up the fact that. You know, more physical does not necessarily mean more skill because the talent level that LeBron James is playing against in the league on a day-to-day basis and the the complexity of defenses and, you know, the systems of like the almost zone defenses and the Popovich defenses and the Steve Kerr defenses and the Quinn Snyder defenses, like all these, rather than being physical, like these teams are, are very sound defensively and just, they're just technically sound. And Michael Jordan did not have to play against these caliber defenses on a nightly basis. He just had to play through a lot of physicality. Um, And just because something is more physical, I don't think that necessarily makes it better physical. A physical defense doesn't mean a better defense, um, which I think is often overlooked. But with all of that being said, while I do think LeBron is a better individual basketball player, I don't think that he will be, I don't think that he can validly be called the greatest of all time because his resume just doesn't like it, it, it it's it in terms of a resume like he's underachieved a little bit like to be 15 years in the league and to only have three championships is a little bit ridiculous seeing as he has been the best player in the league probably since like 2007 2008 um i think it's only 14 years but still oh uh, no this is his 15th season oh oh my bad this will be year 15 when it's done so yeah but yeah um i, I think that he once he wins like yeah, you're right. And to be clear, like I'm a LeBron fan, like I I love LeBron, but um, I think that he sh- he really should probably look into winning two two to three more championships because you know if he let's say he wins two more championships, he'll be five and five in the finals, right? Assuming he doesn't lose again, you know. But he'd be five and five, and it'd be like, oh yeah, like I won one less, but I went five more times, or I went four more times than he did. So yeah, so like that's really what he has to do in your mind to surpass him. To me, yeah, it needs to be two, three more championships and to just play really well um, the last few years because I think it's a given that he's going to pass him statistically. He's already passed him in rebounding and assists. Yeah, he's definitely. Pass him in scoring soon. You know, on all the longevity stuff, he's definitely going to pass him. And just overall, I think when people look back on the league, I think they will probably see him just because LeBron James is so much more of, like, he's such an outspoken person just in terms of, like, you know, how he addresses situations with the media and like social justice issues and all that sort of stuff i think more people will be receptive of the fact that he is the greatest so um i think just to sort of put the cherry on top of all of it i think he should two 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 to three more championships um two more finals mvps and i think he's good i think he i think he i think it'll be more fair to say that he's the greatest because i don't i don't disagree some people think he already is and i really don't 
I don't have a problem with them saying that because just as a player, like I completely understand it. And it is but close. I, yeah. But what are your thoughts on it? Yeah. I think so I, I, I don't even know how I'm going to compare to that epic monologue. Uh, I was trying to time Sorry. it. I, no, don't worry about it. It was awesome to listen to. Uh, so for me, right now, I honestly think it's neck and neck. Like They're essentially the same, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that they've played sing, uh, similar uh, season lengths, and really the only thing that I think LeBron needs to do at this point to change it in my mind is just win one more championship. I don't care how many more finals he win- loses. If he just wins one more, I feel like he has it. Just because he's going to put up way better uh, st- statistics over the course of his career, he's going to have played way more seasons, and like that's, I, I feel like that is a knock on uh, Jordan. The fact that he only played for 13 years because he chose to retire from basketball for those two years for his, allegedly for his father. I've seen a lot of arguments for how it had a lot more to do with gambling. That seems pretty. That seemed pretty compelling. Not like the whole mob argument, but oh, just yeah. he did. He definitely had a gambling issue. That that's well documented. I think. Yeah, and just that, like, the commissioner wanted to uh, do something about it, but, yeah, and then, like, also retiring later on in his career, that was kind of weird, and nobody ever talks about, like, that, whatever the heck was going on with those Wizards teams, like, he didn't yep. do well with them at all. Swept under the rug. Yeah, and, like, if you look at someone like uh, Kareem, who I think is the greatest player of all time, even in his 40s, he was bringing the Lakers to those finals against Michael Jordan. So, and, yep. like, that's, like, the difference between uh, those two players in my mind, and, like, just why I think Kareem is such a better player because he was able to win on his own. I mean, with the Bucks, he won his one championship, and obviously he had Oscar Robertson, but I believe Robertson was like 36 or something. I I don't know. He was way beyond his athletic prime at that point, and then essentially that was it. Like, I think they had the defensive player of the... Now that was later that Sidney Moncrief was on that team. But am I I right about the Sidney, Sidney Moncrief? Yeah, he was the first defensive player of the year. I'm not sure uh, what year. But yeah, I think it was in the 80s, so I think I'm just completely... I think was, yeah, I think it was 83, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, so he either way, like 10 years off, so not really in the conversation. But yeah, like he made that Lakers team in the 70s, like what it was. And when Magic came on, that only made it stronger. And like, I just think that winning six championships and six MVPs when, as you mentioned, voter fatigue makes it so you don't want to give that player an MVP. Like, I think that's a massive uh, point in his favor and just having his unstoppable shot, obviously, that was great. And being able to score that much from a center position that the league was trying to combat ever since the 60s when uh, Wilt Chamberlain and Bill Russell were running all over the league. Like, that was a huge thing. Yeah. And, like, so that's why I have him uh, number one. But, yeah, the LeBron, uh, James, uh, Michael Jordan thing, it's very close and something that nobody ever talks about that, I, I'm glad you've always been someone who has recognized this and like seen it as like a point in his favor is that zone defense literally did not exist in the, I mean, it existed, but you were not allowed to play zone defense in the 90s. Like You can look up highlights from games where teams would literally like try and bring another man to guard Michael Jordan so it wouldn't be one-on-one all the time, and the referee would blow his whistle and say, get away from him. Like, yep. you literally could not play one-on-two. Like, it, it was always one-on-one, and that's a huge factor on and, like, how much he was going to score. I, I mean, it, much more so than hand-checking, in my opinion, but LeBron's obviously helped in the fact that his first year that he played with hand-checking, so that's good for him. Yeah, but also, just going off of that, I feel like, like you were just saying about the whole one-on-one, like, thing, I, I think that LeBron, if LeBron was in a situation where he only ever had to go one-on-one, I think that he would have scored a lot more because... Yeah. And... This isn't even to mention the fact that LeBron is officiated unfairly because he has yes. sort of the Shaq syndrome where like exactly. he's so big, he's so strong that when he gets fouled, they just don't call it because you expect him to make it. Um, and, you know, and anyone who disagrees with that can just look up the whole thing about LeBron and the officiate, like officials because there's so many fouls that he, he's fouled so many times, that, but it never gets so many of the so much of the time it doesn't get called because you know he's just so big that you can't even really see the contact and stuff. Yeah, because it, it doesn't seem to affect him, and he doesn't really sell it, flop the calls like James Harden does. And like, <laughs> yeah, all these other especially players. him. Yeah, especially James Harden is an extreme example, but still, um, if LeBron was able to go one on one and he consistently got foul calls, I, I don't think that there would be like his scoring totals would be crazy because I've never seen ever, I've never once watched a player 
who can stop LeBron James from getting to the rim. Like, I've never... Yeah. And I, so many people love to say Kawhi clamped him in 2014. No, he Kawhi didn't. Kawhi. He scored 28 points per game, and he averaged, like, seven assists and nine rebounds. Like, Kawhi Leonard did a good job, as good a job you can do, but no, Kawhi Leonard did not stop him. No one... And I don't think... Like, there's just no, there's not such a thing as stopping LeBron because LeBron averaged, like, he's averaged 27 points per game. He's averaged 25 or more points per game every year since 2004. And, or 2004, two, the 2004 2005 season. That was the first season he averaged 20, he averaged 27. And since then, he's averaged 25 or more every year since. And he's, and I think he shot around close to, at or above 50% from the field every season. So yeah. if, if if all he had to do was just charge through a guy one-on-one, -on -one, like his scoring ability would be like, they would be so much more like just going off of what you were saying about the whole one-on-one -on -one thing. And I think LeBron has a pretty good handle on the basketball too. So oh yeah, he get like he's a, he's a better ball. passer, which is credit to him because he's a forward and not even a shooting guard. Yeah, exactly. And the thing just... The, the thing with LeBron James is that you could legitimately play LeBron James one through five. And, you know, like you, you really could. Like in a small ball lineup, you can play LeBron James as a center because he's 6'8". Draymond Green plays center sometimes and he's like 6'6 six, six or 6'7". Six, yeah. You could really do it. And then I remember back in Miami when, you know, they would do like, they would do like all these ultra defensive schemes and stuff and they would put LeBron at center and then you would surround him with like Shane Battier, Dwayne Wade and, you know, Chris Bosh and like, he, he would really play, like, even though Chris Bosch was the taller player, LeBron James would play closest to the rim because his athletic ability allowed him to block so many shots and just get up into so many people's, like, shot attempts. Yeah, and he was a bigger body, too, and absolutely yeah. he could play point guard. Yeah, he can definitely play point Yeah, he, there's no question that he can play point guard. Um, so just in terms of versatility as a player, um, you know, LeBron, obviously, I think has him beat in those categories. But, like, because <laughs> almost every Michael Jordan argument I've heard uh, it sort of comes down to all this thing about like killer instinct. Yeah, and like these, a like, in, who's the better yeah, competitor? Yeah, like all these intangible like thing like and like you know I'm not gonna say that those are all dumb because like yes it does matter to a degree what you're able to do in the clutch and you know your level as a competitor because but like the thing that people need to get out of the habit of in my opinion is that people need to get out of the habit as comparing LeBron to Michael Jordan. And just compare LeBron to, like, like look at LeBron as LeBron and don't look at LeBron through a lens of, are you as good as Jordan? You know because what? That is, that is something I've been trying to tell everybody for the longest time. Like, everyone wants to make the argument, who was the better Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan or LeBron James? Like, that's, that's a yeah. nonsensical argument. Obviously, it was Michael Jordan. Yeah, like, he is not Michael Jordan. But everyone insists that because you want, like, and I blame Kobe, Kobe Bryant for this. Because Kobe Bryant was one of those players where he, rather than looking at his ability and what he like, what he was capable of, Kobe Bryant is everyone calls him the closest thing to Michael Jordan, and mm -hmm. it's because he looked, he studied, and he analyzed Michael. Yeah, and he Jordan. tried to be Michael Jordan. Exactly, and he saw that he was the same size, the same weight, had the same ability, could do the same things. Wasn't a great outside shooter, was a great inside shooter. Developed a good post game, was relatively athletic when they were younger. And, like, he looked at that and he realized, like, okay, like, this is the path that I can get and I can take this to greatness. And he just used it to become a, you know, a poorer man's Michael Jordan. And people now look at LeBron and it's like, okay, like, you saw Kobe do this, who is probably the greatest player of the generation next to you, LeBron. So how come you're not doing all this stuff like Michael Jordan? But, like, for what reason is there to do that when they're just completely different players and different people? Like, LeBron, I think, is much closer to Magic Johnson, but for some reason no one ever likes stuff like no one compares him to my, Magic Johnson. and But even that's a little bit unfair because Magic Johnson was a true point guard. And, and he played on better teams. So like, Yeah, exactly. Like People don't look at LeBron James through the lens of, is LeBron James better than Michael Jordan? People look at it through the sense of, how close is LeBron to being as good as Michael Jordan is in our, our, our eyes? But like the thing is, if you have such a biased perspective to the point where you think that he has to prove something versus Michael Jordan, then you're never going to think that LeBron is better and he's never going to be able to pass him in your eyes. I think you just people need to be more subjective about it and just look at it. Ob objective. Like, yeah, objective. My bad. People need to look. People need to look at it more like he's this player, and he's this player. Which player is better? Because 
I think anyone who says that you would rather start a team with Michael Jordan than LeBron James is being a little nonsensical because LeBron James is historically known to make players around him much better. Like, he passes the ball to them. He finds them in open spots. He cares so much about it that if you look up some articles, you can find out that LeBron James actually knows how to pass the ball to his teammates so that they catch it in positions that they like to shoot it. Like, yeah. he knows that, like, he knows that, like, Kyle Korver likes to have his finger in the seam of the ball, like, in the middle. He knows that some people like to be facing the logo of the ball. Like, he knows all these things, and he just cares so much about his team in a team sport, but everyone tries to make it about individual, like, his his level in this situation. Like, put him here, and he wouldn't be able to do this. Like, everyone's like, okay... Like, people always say, like, LeBron didn't do what Jordan did, but there's so many things that LeBron did that Michael Jordan never did and probably wouldn't be able to do that yeah. I just think that people aren't being unbiased about it. And if you really look at it through an unbiased perspective, I don't think LeBron is that far off. Yeah, and, like, the biggest problem, honestly, is just it's so hard, like, 20, uh, almost 30 years ago now to remember all the things that Jordan did wrong and, like, his bad games. Like, you're only going to remember the good stuff at this point. And exactly. that's going to that's gonna be in comparison to LeBron, where you remember a bunch of the bad stuff. You remember, oh, that's right, Draymond Green got injured. Sure, but what about all those players that were injured on the Knicks that could have run through him on the in the ninety, and like the ninety six playoffs or whatever it was. And like, yep, exactly. And also another point that people don't talk about is that some people always try and use this thing about how LeBron's legacy was saved by Kyrie Irving. And yeah, Ray no, that, that's some big BS I've ever heard. Like, it's just trying to fit your narrative. Like, you have a narrative going in that LeBron isn't a clutch player and he goes right. to other players. And then you because, see it and you're like, there it is. Yeah, the dumbest thing I've ever heard is that when people will try and say this thing, they'll be like, they'll say Steve Kerr's shot in that final is different than Kyrie's because... Yeah, no. Michael Jordan went in the huddle and he drew up the play for... for yeah, I've heard that too. For, it was his choice. Like, that's so dumb because LeBron is a facilitator himself. So, like, obviously his first instinct would be to find the player who's going to make the shot. Like, LeBron James doesn't factor his ego into taking shots. And, like, people want him to. It's like people like, why would you shoot that shot with your legacy on the line? Like, the man's goal is not to try and save his legacy in the middle of a game. It's to try and win the game. And like, and that's a, just, that's the best example of like them being like you have to be like Mike, you have to be this one on one performer, and like you can, you can't pass to win the game. You have to take the final shot. Who, who the heck cares if you won the game? Yeah, like if you win the game, then like, I I feel I, I'm not sure on this statistic at all, but I feel like for all the for all like the times that Michael Jordan hit like a game winning jump shot or a game or like a game like ceiling or a game tie. I feel like you could probably find assists that LeBron James has done the same thing, but people don't talk about it because you only you only look at final shots in terms of, like. Do you remember in the in 2016? It was the year that uh, who was it? Uh oh, Malcolm Nova Delaney's won hurt. The, won the NCAA title. Uh yeah, I remember that. And yeah, like just as a side note, thing. it looks like Malcolm Delaney just hurt himself. Oh yeah. <laughs> do you remember? Do you remember when that kid at Villanova? Or I don't want to say kid because they're older than us, but yeah. like, do you, do you remember when he he hit that jump shot to win the game, seventy seven, seventy four? Incredible, and they the championship? absolutely incredible. Yeah, yeah, but like, the one thing I appreciated about that is that there were so many people giving credit to Ryan Archidiakono, who was the kid, who was the guy who gave him the ball. Like, he gave him the assist. Where's he right now? Right. Yeah, like he gave him the assist, but nobody does that in the NBA, where it's like, oh, like what a pass to the game, like what a smart pass, like. No one ever talks about, like, the assist to the game-winning basket, you know? Yeah. Apparently, Archie Diakonos on the G League team for the Bulls, so... Yeah, uh, he is. I've seen him in an NBA game this season, actually. He played a little bit. Oh, okay. Yeah, he, he's around. But, um, yeah, I think people... I don't know. LeBron, I, I just... It, it makes me a little bit upset about how, how people are so fixated on what LeBron's not doing that they just don't even sit back to take a second and look at, like... But he's... He's probably, he's a top, like, at worst, he's the top, like, what, six, seven player? Like, at, like for the people who really hate him, I think. Even yeah, like, people, that'd be harsh. Like, I'd say he's top five no matter what. But, yeah, like, I guess if you really oh, hate like, him. Skip, Skip Bayless has him at nine. What? <laughs> Over who? <laughs> he has nine. Skip Bayless's top five is, like, or top ten, I mean, it, it goes, it's, uh, it's, let me try and do it. I, I want to hear this, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was uh, it was Michael Jordan, then it was Magic Johnson, then it was Shaquille O'Neal. Oh, Shaquille! <laughs> and then it 
then four, I think it was Kareem. Then five, he had Bill Russell. Six, mm. oh no, five, he had Tim Duncan. Six, he had Bill Russell. Well, Tim Duncan seven, is always had, over underrated. Seven, he had Kobe. Eight, he had Larry Bird, and then nine, he had LeBron. Larry Bird. Yeah, what? that that's another argument that I hate. Like Larry Bird, people are like, oh, he's a better passer, better rebounder. Like, okay, like just just please. <laughs> That's ridiculous. The one argument I hate about Larry Bird is that, like, oh my god, he was such an amazing shooter. Uh, Stephen Curry in the past... Oh, way better. Not even that, but, like, Steph Curry in the past two years has shot more threes. Like, Steph Curry has made a... Let me me rewind. Between between the start of the 2015-16 season and the end of the 2016-17 season, so in those two seasons... In those two seasons, Steph Curry made he made he made more threes than Larry Bird did in, in his entire career. Yeah. Like the sample size of how many they shot was so ridiculous. Like he was making one a game, but because because people see thirty eight percent at the or whatever it is, like at the for his career percentage, they're like, Oh my god, Larry Bird was such a good shooter. Like if LeBron was shooting or not uh if LeBron was shooting like let's say, you know, three a game, or not three a game, let's say LeBron was shooting two a game and he was making one every time, he'd be a 50% three-point shooter. But it's not like that. It's like LeBron will end up shooting five and he'll make like one sometimes and sometimes he'll make two, so it'll be somewhere between 30 and 40. Like, but... Yeah, and like just... Like, people just ignore so much and sweep so much under the rug when it comes to, you know, fitting their narrative and just getting the point that they want to make, so... Yeah, and just to your point on Larry Bird versus uh, Stephen Curry, even more telling is their effective field goal percentages because people can be like, oh, but you didn't practice the free. Okay, then uh, if Larry Bird was taking a lot more, you would think that he would have a much higher field goal percentage then. So his best... Yeah. So, like, his best season seasons ever for effective field goal percentage, uh, 87 and uh, 86, uh, right when the Celtics were winning all those championships... He was uh, five five six and five five five, and uh, get ready for the damning fact: Stephen Curry in uh, 2015 six thirty, 2017 six fifteen, 2014 five ninety four, 2011 five eighty three, 2006 2017 2016 uh, five eighty, 2013 2014 five sixty six, and then 2010 five five one. So essentially six seasons already where he was better than him yeah like the the argument like and i i, I think steph curry is the best shooter ever I don't oh know, yeah like, yeah easy yeah i think that's an easy an easy call but the thing like people don't factor in these sample sizes from all these old players like <laughs> larry bird the man shot like he made like 729 threes his entire career and like yeah <laughs> Just because he shot them at a high clip doesn't make him a better shooter. Like, it's like, well, you know, I guess to a degree it does because, you know, the more you shoot, the more you make, that makes you a good shooter. But, like, if you're shooting such a small sample size, you're likely to make more, which will increase your percentage. Like, yeah. The league today is different in the sense that they, you shoot more. Like, so you shoot more, and because you shoot more, you miss more. And when you miss more, your percentage gets lower. Like, that, that, that's simple, that simple math that people don't do when they try to hate on players like LeBron and they're like, Oh, LeBron's a horrible shooter. Like he's not like no one, no one will tell you that LeBron, his shooting splits when he like it, I think it was in 2014 or 2013, one of those years, LeBron's shooting split was 57% from the field and 40, 41% from three. Like that's insane. But no one will, no one, everyone will just tell you LeBron's a horrible shooter. LeBron's this, LeBron's that, but. Yeah, I, I see what you mean by that. And yeah, the, it, it's pretty ridiculous. What are these arguments that people come up with for, it? like, at this point, I think it's taking away from a lot more interesting arguments, like how good is Wilt on the list or how of the players who uh, just recently retired, like Tim Duncan, uh, Dirk, who's about to retire, and then Kevin Garnett, where do they fall on the list? So, like, I. I know something we've yeah. talked about a lot in the past is like, where where does Wilt fill, fit into this, and how do you adjust for the competition that you played against? Yeah. Uh, where where is he falling on your list? Wilt Chamberlain. So a lot of a lot of people that I've talked to have said that this is unfair, um, but I I can't take seriously the careers of Oscar Robertson, Wilt Chamberlain, Bill Russell, all these players who played in such a like because. 
just when you think about the era that they played in, that it was so weak in the sense that in the seventies, like the NBA was almost going bankrupt because of the cocaine yeah. problem. And we're not even and talking seventies; like, we're talking uh, even worse in the sixties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like we're talking fifties, sixties. Yeah, but I'm more for uh, you know Oscar Robertson. I think won a championship in the seventies and stuff like that. Um, but basically, like in the sixties, like how can you tell me that Bill Russell is the greatest player of all time if he played in a league against eight teams and he had eight Hall of Famers on his team and no other team had more than two? Yeah. Like, that's ridiculous. Like, so while I while I commend all these players, like, I, you know, I commend Will Chamberlain for, and, you know, Will oh, Chamberlain, and Bill Russell, and Oscar, like, all these players, you know, I know that they had, a, they had an extremely tough time, obviously, getting into the NBA because back then there was a lot of racism surrounding the sport and all this stuff, and they played with a bunch of white guys. But... Like I, I can't I can't say that they played against like the competition that they played against was nothing. Like Will Chamberlain was in a league where he was seven foot like seven feet tall or he was what, seven two? Seven one, seven two? Uh, seven one, and, yeah. But he had yeah. he had an insane reach. Yeah. He was seven one with an insane reach and the next tallest guy in the league was six eight, and that was Bill Russell. And then after that it's like every other guy was like I don't know, like six two. <laughs> Wait, I, I, don't, I don't know about that, actually, because I, I, I've been reading a lot on it, and, like, there's, apparently there's good points on why none of that was true, and, like, a bunch of the centers in the league were actually that tall. I wish I had the sources on me, but there were, like, four or five good, good ones, and, like, apparently the NBA was really helped by the fact that there were only, like, 12 teams during the time, so they couldn't actually do that much. Well, but, even so, okay, like, let, let's say that then. Like, let's say that there are even four or five. Yeah. Like, and I'm, and I'm not trying to make the argument that, like, the competition then was the same as it is now. It's drastically worse. I'm just saying, like, people saying that, like, it was all white yeah. guys or something. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, then yeah, I'm not sure about all that then. But, like, just in terms of who you played against is so important in my eyes that if you, didn't, if you played in a league where you should have been the best player, then I can't really give you that many props for being the best player because you just did what you were supposed to. Like, you know... Obviously, like when you look at the like, uh, so on my list, like I have I have the current players, like I have Tim Duncan and I have, you know, uh, Kevin Garnett. Like I have all those players ahead of, you know, the Oscar Robertsons, the Will Chamberlains, and the uh, Bill Russells because, in like, you can't like, n regardless of what it is, like regardless, like the era of competition that you played against matters so much that like the league was just completely different then. So, like, you like if you're, you know, travel is easier if you're only playing against eight teams and you don't have an 82-game schedule and you don't have all the same rules and blocks and steals aren't a thing and three-pointers aren't a thing. Like, you're just playing in – it's almost a completely different sport without the three-pointer because, like, everyone is just going inside and, like, heaves from half court that you're skillfully able to make will only count for two points, and that's just ridiculous. So, like, I – and just the way <laughs> – I was talking to a friend about this, and he said that if you put Kyrie Irving in the 60s for basketball, people would think that he was doing some black magic with his dribbling. And, stuff. <laughs> and that, that's honestly probably true. Like, just they – I don't think that some of these players – like, Bill Russell is 6'8", so you can't tell me that he would be here grabbing 55 rebounds no. if he was playing in the league right now. Like, his best rebounding game would probably be, like, 17 18 something around what lebron can can do in a really good game in a really good rebounding game like like if lebron played back then in the 60s like we you don't even know what he would be able to do or if Shaq played back then you have no idea what he would be able to do or steph curry just constantly shooting like every single time like and handling the ball and finishing like all Kyrie irving would like you would never be able to account for the players that we have now in the league back then because like i don't know so i really just don't take it that seriously in terms of all the players that played in like the 60s just because the era was so weak and the league was completely different so i sort of count everything from the modern era and onwards which is when the three-pointer was introduced which was magic johnson's first season in the nba um because I, I just think that like that that game is the game that we have now where we have steals blocks three-pointers you have star players you have you know you have basically everything that you need you have a lot of teams you have you have everything that you need to have a legitimate sports league whereas you know you don't have racism playing a factor and i'm not like i'm not like that's obviously unfortunate but i i don't think that i can factor that into how good of a player you were because there's just nothing that anyone could say to make me believe that bill russell would be averaging 20 and 20 in the league today 
Yeah, and like for me, I mostly think of it the same way, except that Wilt Chamberlain is the only person that gets saved from that just because of his stuff, frankly, outside of basketball, like him literally being an Olympic caliber athlete, getting, being in like the qualifiers for the 60 games, I believe, like where literally he was like one of the best in the world at the high jump. And like, yeah, and when people say like, oh, it was just a bunch of white guys. Okay, maybe that's true. But still, this guy was at one of the greatest athletes in the world and he'd be good enough even today. And like some of the stuff's like yeah, steals and see, blocks. Oh, sorry. With Wilt, uh, so initially I had been really ignorant to Wilt where I, put, I, I, I classified Will Chamberlain into the same category as like the Bill Russell where I was like, oh, like that doesn't mean anything. Like he would have been able to, um, like he, he wouldn't do anything. Like I used to just be like, oh, like Will wouldn't do anything. But then I was watching the, um, this, there was in a social media post after the All-Star game and Joel Embiid was talking to Al Horford and he said that People forget about Will, but Will was so, like, when I watched his videos, he was so athletic that he could jump over anybody. He could play in any era. So when I heard that, I was like, mm, that's, I've never heard that before. So I looked it up, and I, I researched some on Will. And like you just said, he was an Olympic athlete. So, And because of his size, I think Will Chamberlain would have been able to play in the era. Sort of, like, I, I feel like, unfortunately, I feel like he came in the league too early. Yeah. Because... If he had played, if you know, a player like Will in an era, you know, like he could have been, I think, a player like as good as the Kareem, um, like more athletic though. So you know, while I agree, I, I don't think that Will Chamberlain ever would have averaged fifty points per game, and I don't think he ever would have averaged twenty seven rebounds per game. No, but I, I do think Will Chamberlain, if he played, well, like, he'd he be at have, least as good as Shaq. At yeah, least he, he could have. He, he, he like Will Chamberlain probably could have averaged thirty points per game for one season and he probably could have averaged like 12 to 13 rebounds and probably like two to three blocks. Like he could have been a traditional amazing center in the league. Um, but unfortunately because of the time that he played, it's like, I feel like I still can't include him in my top rankings because if I include him, then it's like, I have to include Bill Russell in there somewhere. And then I have to, well, I don't, I don't feel like you do though. I, I feel like Bill Russell, he, you can't even consider him just because of the team that he played on, but because Wilt played on all these crappy teams with like players that nobody knows. And then he like turned himself into like a great player in the seventies against uh, guys like uh, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, like you can, but really yeah. like that's it for, for that error. Then I would probably pull Wilt somewhere around five or six yeah like that's about where i put him yeah yeah because you know if if i were to i just typically i i usually gloss over him in my rankings just because the numbers are so ridiculous that it's like something out of a video game it just doesn't even seem like you can actually put like a put like something on it mm -hmm. um, and also just because we never got to see how he would fare in this league whereas like you know kareem i think is one of those interesting situations yeah like he, he borders it so like you can yeah, really like look at him he, he uh he played half his career before the modern NBA, but then he translated into the modern NBA perfectly fine, and he still won championships in both eras. So, you know, and then, so yeah, I, I think Kareem is, you know, he I think he he is a he's a borderline player in in the conversation, but he you know he's probably the most interesting case about the whole era thing because he he literally played in both. Yeah. And like just to add one more uh, crazy uh, wilt stat for uh, the listeners, uh, based on uh, one guy's estimation from like uh, insider uh, stat keepers who uh, kept track of blocks and steals even though they weren't supposed to, uh, wilt I, I can't find the steals one right now, but based on 112 uh, games that were really kept track of, or about 9% of his career, and yes, this does have some uh, confirmation bias where, I don't know if it's confirmation actually, but some kind of bias where if he's putting up a lot of blocks, obviously you're going to be keeping track of him more. But he was averaging 8.8 .8 blocks per game for 112 of his games. So, like, that's pretty crazy. Yeah. But even still, maybe your point. Yeah, if you play, yeah. So, like, that's I, I think if you played in the league regularly, like, you, you probably could have averaged two and a half to three, something yeah. like that. Um, but no, like, he, he wouldn't have done anywhere near, like, the 50 point games and, like, the yeah, heck, yeah. the 100 point games. Yeah. Um, Wilt is. is it just like it, it's tragic to me how yeah. he doesn't get to get the same limelight as Bill Russell because if you put Wilt on that Celtics dynasty, like they probably would have won every year instead of winning eleven. Yeah, and like just the fact that he was able to play them like essentially to ties er almost every year, and then like he would just lose by like three points in the final game. Like, yeah, it's like, immaculate. Yeah, like, and just it was literally just the thing about strength and numbers. Like it was just like 
at the end of the day, no matter how good one man is, you can't beat eight who are really good. <laughs> yeah. And, like, I do think with those Celtics teams, it was a bit of a Packers effect, and like, in the NFL where the Packers had, like, 13 Hall of Famers when they obviously shouldn't have, like, just all of them were getting championships. So, they're like, well, yeah, these players must be pretty good. But, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, like, I think John, was, who was who was on – was it John Havlicek when it was on the yeah, team? Yeah, Havlicek, yeah. Yeah, like, he was good. Like, I know he was a good player. No, like, like they, had, they had, like, yeah, three or four players that were really good, but they didn't have eight. Yeah, well, still, you know, three or four versus one is no, absolutely. Not the same thing like it, it's today. still it's like Ron and the Warriors. Yeah. So, like, that's that's my feelings on it. But like, how, I I want to get into uh, what you think about like the Tim Duncan, uh, Dirk, and like Kevin Garnett cases because I never hear anyone talk about them, and it's a really interesting case. So, um, out of those three players that you just named, despite me being a huge, huge, huge Dirk Nowitzki fan, I don't think he is better than either of them. Um, oh. Hmm. So I think Dirk is. Dirk Nowitzki to me is underrated in the sense that he was like without Dirk Nowitzki, I don't think there is such a thing as a stretch four because in the oh, NBA, in the NBA at least because Dirk was really the first in in terms of like the nineties like you like yes there were tall guys who were like six seven six eight who were shooting threes like that was a thing but when Dirk Nowitzki came like. It was so unconventional to see a seven footer who should be a center playing like sh- playing at the perimeter and like just in terms of what what Dirk Nowitzki did for stretching a defense like where you have your big man like Dirk Nowitzki is on the perimeter and because he can score from the perimeter the and like since he was playing in like the early two thousands and the late nineties this is when every team or all the good teams had one really good like shot blocker or one really good paint defender. You would have to bring that paint defender out of the paint because he would have to guard Dirk, and then everyone around Dirk could just cut to the basket, and they wouldn't have to worry about getting their shots blocked. And I think Dirk really, like, he was, I think, one of the figureheads of this whole three-point, like, centric thing before it was even really a thing. Like, he was early on it, basically, is what I mean. Because, like, prior to that, like, what seven-footer was shooting threes before Dirk? Like, you know, Kareem was never out there shooting threes, and, like, you know, all the other centers who played in like the eighties and all, all this, like none of them were out there shooting like, you know, Luke Longley on the team with Michael Jordan and Patrick Ewing and like all these other guys were not shooting threes. So while I think Dirk changed the game from that aspect and because he's played so long that he's been able to accumulate a lot of points and a lot of rebounds and, you know, have a lot of good statistics. I just think that the, the problem with Dirk is that Dirk is not, as good a defender as either of the yeah. other two. I don't even think it's close. I don't even think Dirk has ever made an all defensive. Yeah, I don't think Dirk has ever made an all defensive team. Um, and uh, he's been a good rebounder for most of his career, somewhere around eight, but he's never really been like 10, 11 rebounds per game. So um, I love Dirk with all my heart, uh, but he also, um, he got screwed out of a championship in 2006, but he yes. did, He they, his team did kind of choke in 2007. When they won sixty-seven games and then lost to the We Believe Warriors, that should not have happened. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I love Dirk. But I, in order of those three, I put Dirk last. But here's where I think the debate between Tim Duncan and Kevin Garnett is very, very interesting. Yeah. And here, let me just stop you uh, right there, so that I can. I, I just looked at the list of like some of the best uh, shooting uh, big men in NBA history. Obviously, uh, Dirk was uh, it, really the one that made the big difference. We have players like Brad Miller, uh, Charlie Villanueva. Three point percentage of three four six. Our our, our old friend uh, Arvidas Sabonis. Oh yeah, yeah, he could do it. But th- that's the thing. Like he came from Europe, right? Yeah. And he Arvidas Sabonis is also he's an interesting '90s story because he he probably could have changed up the NBA if he had played in the NBA for his prime and, and was an injured, the yeah. time. But Dirk, he was the fr- he also he did this thing where he he was really the first like superstar in my eyes to come internationally like he was one of the first players who became a superstar drafted by the nba that was international and then you know if you listen to all these other foreign guys like tony parker and manu ginobili and then like all these players talk about how like dirk's influence coming from europe was was really big on like a lot of european players who were like oh yeah like players can come to the nba and be successful like you know dirk just really i think started a lot for the game in terms of offensively stretching the floor and just in terms of opening the game up internationally um yeah, something I, I just don't. I don't think he gets enough credit for that. Um, but no, and I definitely agree. And uh, just to finish off the list, because I think some of the names are pretty interesting. You have yeah, Bill Lambeer, who I never knew was good at the free. 
Uh, yeah. Mem- Mehmet Okur, who I think has just completely disappeared from everyone's mind, but he made a couple of All-Star games in the 2000s. Who did? Uh, Mehmet Okur. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I feel like I've heard that name. I don't really know him, though. Yeah, he, he was, uh, like, first Turkish player in the NBA. Uh, Troy Murphy, uh, and, yeah, that's pretty much it. But, yeah, no, certainly Dirk is the best to ever do. And then when you, look at the, when you look at those names, the one that you really know out of all of them is Dirk Nowitzki and Bill Lambeer. Yeah. You know, so. Um, but, yeah, uh, Tim Duncan and Kevin Garnett, though. So I have a friend, and we talk about this pretty frequently, and it's that Kevin Garnett, I think, is much more talented than Tim Duncan. But Tim Duncan will always be seen as greater because of his team success. Yes. Because, and what's unfortunate about that in my eyes is that I think that if you put Kevin Garnett on the Spurs, then you, you know, if you, if you let, like, let's remove personality and like, you know, like fit and stuff from the equation, just in terms of talent only, like from a talent and basketball only perspective, if you put Tim, if you put Kevin Garnett on the Spurs instead of Tim Duncan, I think the Spurs would have been more successful because hmm. what Tim Duncan did as a, like, and, you know, you could give or take, but, like, Tim Duncan, if you look at Tim Duncan's career at the end, like, 19 points per game, I think, 11 rebounds, two blocks. And while Tim Duncan is, a, I, I do think he's the best power forward ever, like, fundamentally, like, he was perfect. Kevin Garnett, I just think, brought more talent because... If you look at it, Kevin Garnett could consistently shoot mid-range jumpers. He could make he wasn't a three-point shooter or anything, but he could make threes like every, you know, once in a blue moon. Tim Duncan, you never really saw shooting any threes. Kevin Garnett could do that. There was a period of time where Kevin Garnett for a full season averaged six assists per game. I think his his uh, his season that it was the year he won MVP or one of the years close to when he won MVP. He was averaging like 24 points, six rebounds or six assists, 12 rebounds one and a half steals, 1.9 blocks. Like just in terms of pure talent, I think if you remove personality from the equation, I think putting Kevin Garnett in Tim Duncan situation and putting Tim Duncan in Kevin Garnett situation would be very interesting because I think Kevin Garnett is one of those superstars in the NBA who, who really, really suffered from being in a, in a horrible situation because, you know, the Minnesota oh, definitely. Timberwolves were, they were an expansion team and they just weren't any good ever. And, he, like he was leading that team to the playoffs until like it just it just got so bad that he just couldn't do it anymore and like he won an MVP on in Minnesota like <laughs> that that has to count for something and just luckily he got traded to the Celtics when he did because if he didn't then he probably never would have won a championship no but I think the debate between those two players is very interesting uh, I'm not mad at anyone who thinks that Tim Duncan is better because obviously Tim Duncan is his personality and his work ethic and all that stuff allowed him to succeed more. Um, but just in terms of talent, I don't think anyone can sleep on Kevin Garnett. And I, just for the record, I think both Kevin Garnett and Tim Duncan are both better than Carl Malone. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And like the only thing that it was going for Carl Malone was that he played 20 years and he was a pretty Same good center. Big score, but, yeah. but he was a horrible person. Never talks about Carl Malone is like Carl Malone's all. Of, I, I, I probably like half of Carl Malone's field goals are from John Stockton assists. So yeah. Like, he played with the best uh, assister in league history, and he was also a pretty horrible person. Like, he had, like, something like 11 kids with, like, four different wives, and, like, like beat his wives, and, like, he just wasn't a good person. Yeah. And also, Carl Malone, like, and overrated, like, not, not defensively, he's... Whoa, like, whoa! Oh, sorry, sorry, it's like a fight starting. <laughs> um, Carl Malone defensively, as well, is not nothing to behold, whereas I think it's a... I think when you analyze power forwards, like, you know, these, and I think this is what makes this an interesting discussion, like you were saying, is that these players don't classify as centers, but power forwards don't really exist in the game today anymore um, in terms of pure power forwards. But back then, from that time during the league where all these players were good, like, you know, the, the late 90s and the early 2000s, and, like, a power forward was that player that you needed to anchor your defense and also be pretty good on offense, and Carl Malone just wasn't that much on defense. Like, he was really good offensively, but whatever. Yeah, and like my thing with uh, uh, Tim Duncan versus uh, Kevin Garnett, and like I, I do put them above Dirk as well. It's just that like I, I feel like their personalities do matter in the in in like talking about them because oh like, they do they definitely do. What I was saying was if you were able to remove them. Oh, I, I thought you meant like completely from the conversation of like who was better. 
Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, okay, Tim my bad. That was just my intro. Yeah. Tim okay. Duncan's personality allowed him to be better is yes. what I'm saying. Like, that was what I was going to say, yeah. If Kevin Garnett was able to just not be, like, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I love Kevin Garnett, but I, like, he's, he's very, you know, ecstatic and very... Um, he's a wild dog. Yeah, he's he's energetic. He's, you know, he's he's a great, like... But if Kevin Garnett was less emotional, just in terms of, like, outcries and screaming and, like, ah, you know, anything is possible. Like, if he was less about that and he was more, like... If he was reserved, calm, quiet, cerebral, and like just thought more and thoughtful, like Tim Duncan, then and then he was like basically like I think Kevin Garnett was more talented, but I don't think he was better. Like that's weird to say, but I just think that Kevin Garnett, in terms of a basketball player, he was able to do more. Like he could pass the ball, he could shoot from a little bit further, and he was you know just as good on defense. So maybe not just as good, but. Maybe a little bit more versatile defensively because he could get in the passing lanes and steal and yeah. a little bit better score, I think. so. Yeah, and everyone's always talking about, oh, Kevin Garnett could really fill that stat sheet. But I, I was actually reading, uh, apparently uh, Tim Duncan got screwed out of a quadruple double early oh, on. he did, yeah. Yeah, I think he had like eight blocks or something, but they didn't count two of them. Yeah, and like yeah. if he, even if he just had something like that, you would never hear that conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it was a. I think it was the 2003 finals game. No kidding! I didn't realize that. Yeah, I think it was something like that. It was like a. It was it was some game where he. I think it was like he had like 20, 20, 10, and eight. But there was something about how like they missed two two of his blocks and never counted it. So. Yeah, that's unbelievable. Uh, yeah, yeah, 2003 finals. That would have been the greatest performance ever. That is seen as one of the, but not the. Yeah. One of the greatest finals. Uh, yeah, I think I think so too. But Whew. I don't know. Just the one thing to me about basketball players that I think always like that signals to me that you're on like the next level is your your ability as a passer. So like this is a this is something that I not like Anthony Davis. I think is a better player than Demarcus Cousins. Yeah. But Demarcus Cousins is a better passer, and so because of that, I feel like Demarcus Cousins, you can put him in more places, and you can expect a little bit more from him because. Like, the thing with Anthony Davis is that, like, let's say, like, his jump hook is just so, or not jump hook, but, like, well, let's say that his his shot is just so off that he's just missing a ton of layups. Like, it doesn't really seem like he can hurt you that way in, in any other way offensively aside from, you know, well, you know what, what, like, offensive rebounds maybe. But, like, the thing to me is a passer, like, players, when a player is a good passer and a good scorer, it signifies to me that, like, they're, they're so talented offensively that, even if something that for them personally is not working, they can still help their team win games because they can allow points to get put on the board through assists, which is why I have such a hard, high regard for LeBron because, you know, like, okay, like 20, like 27 points per game, right? Like, and let's say that you're having an off night and you only have 16, you getting seven assists, and let's say they're all for two, that's plus 14. You just added 14 points to the board through your passes, and that's, that's amazing. And then not to mention that some of them would be three, so it would probably be somewhere around like 20. And yeah, you know, it's so it's, important to be a good passer, especially today, but like at any time but, in the league. And it was more rare back then, which is why I give Kevin Garnett more props for it. Because I mean, to average 24 points, six assists, 12 rebounds or whatever it is, like that's, that's extremely impressive for someone that big. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the, there was one other point I wanted to make on that. Um, crap. What was it? Ah, I completely lost it. But nice. yeah, I, I, it's a very close case between those three, and really, I, I I don't need people to be saying that like they're the greatest full time, but I just want to hear them in the conversation because like right now they're not talked about at all. At least at least from what I'm hearing. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. Honestly, I think Kevin. I, I put Kevin Garnett as the tenth best player ever. <laughs> yeah, well, like that's about where I have him too. I think I have Tim Duncan fifth. Oh, also, just this is for the record, Tim Duncan over Kobe Bryant. Yeah, yeah, I, I had to think about that for a minute, but yeah, that Kobe really only scored. I like I like Tim Duncan over Kobe Bryant. A lot of people don't like that, but at the, I remember this, Ryan, when we were talking a few years ago, when this was sophomore year, and it was Tim Duncan's last season, and we were talking about how if he made that All-NBA third team that year, Oh, I remember this, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He would have been, like, you could have, because I remember you said that all NBA selections are one of those things to you that matters, like, in the sense of, like, that means that you were 
you were a top 15 player for that many years just signifies your greatness. And yeah, no, like, I still think that. Yeah, yeah, and I agree with that as well. So and he just missed it too. Yeah, he did. He was he was high in the voting, I think. The third team that year ended up being like, I don't, I don't even remember. But, yeah, I'll um, check it. Uh, yeah, like, oh wait, did he make it? Oh, he actually. Uh, wait, now I'm not sure. Uh, this was 2000. Uh, no, he made it 2014, 15. My bad. Uh, that no, yeah. Aldridge made it over him, and so did uh, Drummond. Yeah, Aldridge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because that was the last year that um, yeah, what to do. Yeah, and like the biggest thing behind that was because he was uh, in a he was like, uh, crap. This doesn't do what I usually like. I I usually uh, have my score ready for the All NBA selections, but that would have put him in a tie with uh, Kobe Bryant for uh, All NBA selections. If you look at it by, you get three points for being in the first team, like a top five player in the league, uh, two yeah, points but, for second team, and one for third team, and that would have been huge. But but here is what no one talks about, my friend. Kobe Bryant came out of high school. Tim Duncan played four years of college. Exactly. So, like, if... I, I'm just saying, if Tim Duncan had came into the league in that 1996 draft with Steve Nash and Tim Duncan... Or, no, Steve, Steve Nash, Kobe Bryant, and uh, everyone else in 96, and Allen Iverson was in that draft as well. Like, that would have been something, because that draft would instantly get a lot better. Um, I feel like it would... It, it would and it would give Tim Duncan one more year because Tim Duncan made All NBA second team. No, he made All NBA. What what team did he make? He made All NBA first team as a rookie. Yes, he did. Yeah, so he made All NBA first team as a rookie. So if he had came in '96, and then you know, then he probably would have made like. Hold up! I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you here. I'm in the last ten seconds of the game. Oh yeah. All right, here we go. Six, five, four, three. Oh, he's going to the lane. We got overtime! Okay. Oh, well, yeah, this game actually turned out to be really good. <laughs> yeah, okay, so back to what you were saying. Um, no, like, if Tim Duncan had played, uh, you know, if he, had, if he had come out a year earlier from college, then he, uh, you know, he would have... He would have been something. He would have really been some. Yeah, he would have uh, had a lot more of his career to really play for. But Tim Duncan, I think, is just, like, he's supremely underrated in these conversations because, like, I mean, as a rookie, like, he might be one of the best rookies of all time. Like, yeah, 21 points, two and a half blocks, 12 rebounds, 2.7 assists, 55% from the field. Um, like, I would be curious to see all of the rookies in NBA history that have made the All-NBA first team. I, yeah, I don't even, that list is, because LeBron didn't even make an All-NBA team as a rookie. No, he didn't. A little, he didn't know. He he made second team his second year, but he he didn't make he didn't make an All NBA team his first year. Yeah. Uh, okay. It looks no. That's not what I wanted. Forget it. But yeah. I mean, I, even honestly, like let's say Tim Duncan came out and I don't know. Like that that is something to me that's interesting about Tim Duncan is that Tim Duncan is probably the only player that played four years in college. Um, and oh, Kareem, like really good player. Because even Kevin Garnett. You know, he came out of high school. Like, what if Tim Duncan had came out of, as a freshman in high school? Like, what if he was a one and done? And then, you know, he was just – because here's the thing to me. It's like if you play four years in college and you're that good when you get into the NBA, to me that signifies that you were ready before your first year, like before your last year in college. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, I feel like Tim Duncan probably could have came out in the NBA. Like, he probably could have came out in the same draft as Kevin Garnett and been like, a, you know, just finished his sophomore year and, you know, Gave up his last two years, and then he probably could have added two seasons to to his uh to his resume, which he would have been able to do a lot. Yeah. I, also, I just want to say I'm an idiot. I thought I it, I don't know if you're getting this the entire time, but for the live stream that we're watching, there's this giant red button in front of the score. So when when it was counting down, I thought it was counting down to the final seconds, but it actually was counting down to like the final minutes. Oh. So yeah, <laughs> whoops. It's still one ten, one ten. Yeah, That's yeah. Cool. I, I and I have like another scoreboard uh, popped up uh, up top, but I just didn't didn't think it updated yet. But yeah, I'm at like fifty nine point seven seconds left. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm tr I'm trying to pull up right now a list of all rookies to uh, make the uh, All NBA uh, first team. I just pulled something up on Reddit. Let's see what the comments have to say. Uh, Wes, no, no, that's not it. Uh, Larry Bird, apparently. Oh, that's hopefully that wasn't water. 
no, no, it wasn't. Okay, cool. Uh, Wilt. Uh, who else? Uh, Shaq, apparently. Uh, yeah, it seems like that's pretty much it. Yeah, I don't think that... You know... <laughs> yeah, I it's think... Just, uh, it's probably not something that we'll see for a long time. We're, we're probably not going to see that ever again because the level of the level of these players that are coming out of like it's really it's more rare now that we see really really good players coming out of college. I think because I mean t- the twenty sixteen draft was honestly out of, outside of Ben Simmons, like none of those players have really turned out to be much. Yeah, and like even Ben Simmons, he's been a bit of a world beater on the seventy sixers, and like even him, he's he might not even make a single All NBA team. Oh, this year, yeah, I don't think he will. He, he honestly, he's been like Ben Simmons. I think is like he, he's averaging like I think seventeen, seven, and seven. Yeah, he's been but awesome, he, but like it's just the veterans are so good. Yeah, like all these like like I we we discussed all NBA teams uh, on uh, the All Star special, and like he didn't even come up as an option, no. which is crazy to think that like we had like you know like honestly. Like, <laughs> I don't think there's any doubt in anyone's mind that Ben Simmons is overall is a better player than LaMarcus Aldridge, but we had LaMarcus Aldridge making a team, so. Yeah, I mean, that one was weird, but who knows? Like, if he can keep it, if he can keep it up and maybe get his points up a little bit more, maybe that can happen. Who knows? Yeah, uh, okay, honestly, like, the one thing that's been so ridiculous to me the last few seasons is, uh, or not last season, but the two seasons prior, like, Clay Thompson making, so... In yes. 2016, Clay Thompson made an All NBA third team, averaging 20, 20 points per game, twenty or twenty one or something like that. James Harden averaged twenty seven, seven and six, and that, he didn't make was, a single team. That was one of the worst snubs I've ever seen. I, I, actually, I think I, I, I don't want to quote myself on this, but I really think it was twenty nine points per game. It was oh, 20, I'll check. I think it was twenty twenty nine points per game. I'll double check right now. Yeah, it was no, it was twenty. Yeah, it was 29. Yeah, oh, my he God. 29, he averaged 29 points per game, seven and a half assists, six rebounds, and he didn't make an All-NBA team, and he led the league in minutes. Yeah, that was absurd. And, like, if people were saying his defense was bad, but I don't care how bad your defense is. Like, that's, that's – you can't leave him off the team. Yeah, no, st- statistically, like, 29 points per game, 1.7 steals, seven and a half assists, six rebounds, 86% from the free throw line, 36% from three, 44% from the field – and you, given the inefficiency of players these days, like that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, just that was that was one of the worst. The 2016 season overall was just such a strange season, just in terms of 73 wins, Kobe's retirement, like you know the the Timberwolves were awful, the Spurs losing in the second round, LeBron and all them, like everything was so crazy. Oh yeah, and uh, just in terms of. Uh... That was a bad segue. Uh, I, I wanted to talk about what you think about the NBA Hall of Fame and like how uh, loose their standards are. Do you think it's a good thing for them? No, I, I wish it was a little bit more strict, but at the same time, like, uh, like, uh, like the thing that you were mentioning earlier about like how how is it that you can just put like all these players in the Hall of Fame who are on that team just because they won a lot, even though they weren't that good? Like to me, it just sort of makes it me a lot less, um, like. If you, if you really think about it now, like, a player like like LaMarcus Aldridge could be in the Hall of Fame. And, yeah, you know, like, is he really a Hall of Fame caliber player? Like, you know, you spark a debate about that. And, like, you look at the this, this Warriors team, right? And, like, it's like people are automatically saying that, like, this team has four Hall of Famers. But, like, is Draymond Green really a Hall of Famer? Because, like, if he wasn't on the Warriors, then you have no idea if he would even be this meaningful or impactful as a player. Like, he's a system player, so you don't really even know if he would be this if he was somewhere else. So, I don't know. I think the Hall of Fame, like, I, I feel like maybe you should have some sort of criteria. Um, maybe something like, I don't want, I wouldn't say you have to have one championship because then you would have, like, Charles Barkley, Steve Nash, and all these other players wouldn't be in it. But maybe something like you have to have maybe... You know, you and I always talk about the importance of All-NBA selections. Yeah. Because, like, all the best players have made All-NBA teams. So maybe some qualification could be, like, you know, you had to have, had to have at least made, like, maybe one All-Star game, one All-NBA team, um, something like that. Yeah, and, like, that that's, like, a bare minimum thing right there. 
Like if you yeah. think of like some of the players that have made like just one All NBA third team in their career. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like honestly, you're right. That that criteria would be weak because Goran Dragic has played two All Star games and has made an All NBA team. But like, I don't you know, think like someone like Sean Marion. Like, yeah, I don't think anyone views Goran Dragic as a as a. Or he's a one time All Star, one time All NBA third team, one time Most Improved Player. That's Goran Dragic. Yeah. But he like you know he's not anyone that anyone thinks. He's not. He, no one views him as as a as a Hall of Fame player. So. Yeah, definitely, and like. Friends needs to be stricter. Yeah, like for me, I I would go as far as saying like you got to be on like at least four All NBA teams. But yeah, that's just me, and uh, just going down the list. Oh, no, you think four? You know who? What that's interesting for? I think Paul Pierce has only made three. Well, I don't think Paul Pierce is a Hall of Famer, anyways. Oh, no, you're right. Paul Pierce has made four. Okay, yeah, Paul Pierce, I think, is one of the most supremely overrated players. I know all the all the fans of the 2008 Celtics championship team are going to kill me for it, but Kevin Garnett was the best player on that team, and, yeah. like, there's no doubt. Like, and Draymond Green, I, I disagree with Draymond Green on a lot of things, but the other day he said something like, people, don't, people always forget that Paul Pierce was on the trading block every year before the big three got there and that he was losing every year in the first round of the playoffs or not even getting to the playoffs sometimes, which is true. <laughs> Yeah, and like so, yeah. between 2000, 2006, 2007, Paul Pierce did not make the playoffs. So hmm. the two years prior to the trade. So yeah, just going through some of the players that would like exceed that criteria, like Yao Ming, he made five All NBA teams. So don't tell me that four is too many. Uh, Vince Carter, he's made four. Uh, who else? Uh, let's see. Vince Carter, though. I do think Vince Carter should be a Hall of Famer. Yeah, I think he's right on the edge. Because the thing with Vince Carter is he, um, like, if you look at his, like, career, like, just his numbers, like, he was one of the most consistently great players. Like, just, like, I'll read you some of his uh, some of his stats, right? So, as a rookie, he averaged 18 points, 6 rebounds, 3 assists. Then his second year, he averaged 26 points, 4 assists, 6 rebounds. Next year, he averaged 28 points, four assists, six rebounds. Then 24 points the next year, 21 the next year, 23 the next year. Then he was injured, so he averaged 16. First year back from injury, he averaged 28, then 24, then 25, then 21, then 21. And then slowly he started fading, and then you know, then he averaged 17, and then 15, and then 14, and then 10, and then 13, 12. But like, just consistently, he's just been such a good player. And the fact, in my opinion, that he's played in the league, even though his prime was literally over in 2010, or no, he, his prime ended at the end of the 2009 season, and he's still playing in 2018. Like, to me, it's just a testament as to how, like, how good you are to be able to keep your game going, that you're still in the NBA after this, this long after your prime has. Because, you know, we see players who, like, they'll play for a long period of time, like Kareem and LeBron, but it's because they're able to, like, their, their bodies and or their style of play just allow it so that, they can just keep doing what they're doing. They didn't really have to change up that much. Like Kareem could shoot sky hooks till he was 40 and LeBron is still so athletic. But I think Vince Carter is one of those interesting cases where he's been out of his prime since 2009, but he's still in the league just because he's been able to adapt his game and become like a three point shooter. Um, you know, and just energy and a locker room guy and stuff. And I just think it would be good to, to, to see him because what it would because of what he did for the dunk contest and stuff like that. So, yeah, and just uh, I, I finally found a list uh, with uh, all players to uh, make the All NBA team ever, and apparently ninety three players have had four or more selections. So ninety three is a sizable amount right now. I don't know how many exactly are in the Hall of Fame. Obviously, that's yeah. including college players and like WNBA, but I feel like that's a reasonable I, amount. Well, yeah, four four would be a good a good cutoff then, like. But like I think you know. Or maybe like even if if some because some some players would like like here's what I think is really sad like this is just a case but like Derek Rose for example like some people like because he or this this actually I don't know if you know this but every MVP had, is an Hall of Fame like every player oh wow player. I didn't know that so except but the one or well and every player who has one MVP that is not yet in the Hall of Fame is someone that we assume will be in the Hall of Fame like Kobe Bryant LeBron. The one player who's very interesting is Derrick Rose because who shouldn't make it, but yeah, yeah. and which is sad because, like, I I just I feel for I feel bad for him, but 
I don't know, maybe if you wanted to do something where you wanted to work out something for players like, you know, like, because not like Chauncey Billups, I don't know if he's made four, but some, no, people, he has. some people would argue that he's a really good player. Like, so Cha- Chauncey Billups has made three, right? Uh, so, oh, yeah, my bad. Sorry. Yeah, so, you know, you can make an argument for something like maybe you can count like a second team a little bit more than a third team or a first team a little bit more than a second team. Which is what I do, but I just can't find a spreadsheet right now. Yeah, yeah. And then, like, if you count, like, a finals MVP, you can count for something. And then, like, you know, you can account for, like, an, a regular MVP season award. You can account for all-star games. You can account, like, maybe, like, basically every award that they won or that they had, like, every award can count for something different to, like, you know, let's say, like, Rookie of the year, you can count for something. Defensive player of the year, you can count for something. Most improved, sixth man of the year, all NBA first, second, third, all star game. Like basically, you just count everything, but you give them like a point system where you count, you rank everything as like being a certain number of points. And then if they exceed a certain number of points, they get to be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. And like to, to your point on with someone like Derek Rose, I think it's so important that when you're evaluating a player's career, You have to look at like either like their best five years or like their best six in baseball. They do their best seven. You have to look at that separately from the rest of their career. And then you look at the rest of their career overall, and then you just average the two. So that you have players who had fantastic peaks alongside players like Carl Carl Malone, where they were great for 21 years or so. Yeah, because see, here's the thing, like consistency, I think is very important, which is something, this is something that I personally do. Like when I'm looking back at retired players, like I'll rule out their first year, uh, like I'll, I'll take out their first year and then I'll take out like any year in which they had like an injury or something like, you know, like, like, let's say like for, for, uh, for Paul George, like there was a season where he only played six games because, um, he, because of the leg thing, like he came back at the end of the season and only played six games. So like I remove any season like that and then I remove their rookie year because, and then I also remove their best statistical year because, in my eyes, if you remove their worst year, their best year, and then you just look at everything else that they did in between, you'll get a much better idea of who the player really is. Oh, that's interesting. Because, because then that way you're not looking at any extreme like outliers in terms of how bad they were or in terms of how good they were. Because like for a player like Matt Ryan, right? This is football, but for Matt Ryan, right? Like everyone knows, or at least I know, or at least I think that <laughs> Matt Ryan is not like he's not like a like he's not like a superstar quarterback, but a lot of people were getting like a misconception that he was when they when the Falcons went to the Super Bowl last year. So w- I heard someone say that like if you just look at Matt Ryan aside from this year and then you take out his rookie year, who Ryan, who Matt Ryan is is a very average quarterback. Like he's he's a good quarterback, but he's not like a superstar. Like he's not Aaron Rodgers, Drew Brees, um, Tom Brady, and all these other guys. So to, for an example of that right now, right like. If you take out Derrick Rose's rookie year where he averaged 17, then you take out his best season where he averaged 25 and won MVP, like you get a pretty good idea of who Derrick Rose was. He goes 21 points, then 22, then 16, then 17, then 16, then 18, and then 10. Like, you know, that's the player that he was. He was a player who could get you a couple points, a couple assists, and wasn't anything spectacular. Yeah, that's it. I... I, I'm really surprised I've never heard that before. That's a really interesting way of thinking about it that I've quite honestly never heard before. And like, yeah, yeah I've, 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 I've seen, cause it helps a lot. I think for players that have either retired or for players that have had some sort of, cause like for the thing is like, and the reason that I think it's relatively like, you know, reasonable is because like when you look at a player like LeBron, right? Like if you look at, if you look, uh, so I'll pull up LeBron's stats right now. So LeBron, has <clears throat> let's see so lebron if you take out lebron's first season where he averaged 21 points per game then you take out his best season which i'll say his best season just for for this is um because i'm looking at it right now i'll say his best season is when he uh led the league in scoring which was a really he had he averaged 30 points eight rebounds seven assists 1.1 blocks 1.8 steals so i'll remove that year and okay. then you'll, you'll go down the bronze line and you'll go 27, 31, 27, 28, 29, 26, 27, 26, 27, 25, 25, 26, 27. And like, that's how you get a pretty good idea of like, okay, that's the player he was. So. Oh, huh. that's I'm surprised how effective that is. That is pretty good. And I, yeah. I finally finished, uh, in just assembling my own spreadsheet of these things. And, uh, 
just going down the top 10 of uh, who it would be if you uh, ranked him by uh, all NBA selections with uh, first team being three points, uh, second team being two points, and for third team being one. That would be uh, Kareem, Kobe Bryant, uh, Tim Duncan, Karl Malone, Shaq, LeBron, Bob Cousy. Wait, LeBron? That's not right. So, uh, uh, I think LeBron has more, though. LeBron yeah, no, I, this spreadsheet's wrong. Uh, I'll, I'll fix it in a second. But, yeah, uh, I'll vamp for me for like you know, 10 seconds for me to fix this. <laughs> so, how many points do you have all NBA first counting for? Uh, three points. And then two, you have two? Yes. So LeBron should have 11 times 3 is, what, 33, and then 33 plus 4 is yeah. 37. I just had the spreadsheet uh, doing the wrong, uh, sorting by the wrong uh, column. And yeah, so LeBron has 37. Yeah. Uh, why is it not doing the correct one? Uh, hmm, that's weird. Okay. Uh, I guess I'll come back to that then. But yeah, do you think like an MLB system takes it too far where they only have like 250 players in their entire 120 year history where uh, that can make the Hall of Fame like players that have won like multiple MVPs and like multiple championships might not even make it see I think that would be a little bit too far because um, <clears throat> like the thing about basketball is like basketball is one of those two things it's one of those sports where like it's a lot, I think basketball is a sport that's more based around the individual. Like you can really, I think it's the only sport where you can put one player on a team and then you instantly have a complete blip. Like, because, you know, in football you have so many players that like, you know, you have multiple people that can impact the game. Like basketball, you only have five on the court at one time. So I think with basketball, I think it should be a little bit more open because every individual that's played has been different. Like in terms, or not not every because you know we're talking about like Kobe and Michael are very similar but like every player did different things every player has their own little thing about their game that was you know like just because it's so heavily driven on the individual I think just in order to acknowledge all the different types of players and all the different players that have we've seen I think that it would be I think it's fair to say that like if you were at some point a top 15 player in the league and you were consistently one of those players and you were good for a couple years and you you're just like you were you were among the top for a certain period of time, then I think that then it's fair for you to be in the Hall of Fame because it's like, that means that any player who actively watched the NBA for those four or five years that you were really good will know you. And obviously you'll be hitting a large number of people. And then like, so I, I think that what you and I have been talking about with like four plus NBA teams and then just some other awards will, should be should be the qualification. I don't think it should be too strict because – you know, if it was super strict like like what you're talking about, then you know you'd have players like Chauncey Billups and like you know Paul Pierce and Vince Carter who will probably all end up in the Hall of Fame. But you know, if it was stricter, then they probably wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's basically how I feel too. Like it's the the baseball one can get a little ridiculous, and it, it's fun to be nihilistic with it sometimes. But like then you see uh, some of the great players that don't make it, and you feel really bad for them, and like. They're in their 70s and like they really want to make the Hall of Fame and then they still don't get to be in it and it just gets ridiculous. Yeah, that, that's that's sad. Like I, I would never want to see a bunch of old NBA players who can't even walk anymore be denied from the Hall of Fame. <laughs> yeah, uh, that would suck. What did you think about uh, Tracy McGrady getting inducted? Did you did you like that? I personally, I uh, he 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 was on the edge for me. I because I, I know a lot of people think a lot of people don't view him as being that good because he was really like he was he was good for maybe like what a one two like a six year stretch and then otherwise he was all right yeah like i i thought that he he did do honestly actually i haven't done enough research on him to be honest i i'm just thinking of stuff like okay he was pretty good and you know, with the raptors and then i'm thinking of like his uh 30 39 not 39 what am i talking about 13 points in like 13, 38 seconds yeah yeah well, but I have no clue how he was the rest of that season. So, so here's Tracy McGrady. I'll give you some numbers just because I have them in front of me. So, as a rookie, he averaged seven points per game, four assists or four rebounds, one ass, one and a half assists. Then he went nine points, six rebounds, two assists. Then his third year in Toronto, he was averaging fifteen, three assists, six rebounds. But then he, this is what you know how he. So then he he signed in free agency with Orlando, I think. Oh yeah, that's right. 
So he jumped from 15 points per game to 27. And then he went 27 points, 8 rebounds, 5 assists. Then 26 points the next season, 5 assists, 8 rebounds. Then 32 points per game. He led the league in scoring. 6 assists, 7 rebounds. Then 28, 6, 6. So I think... He's he's an interesting case because he, he sort of came out of nowhere for a little while and he wasn't really he was he was really good but I don't think he was amazing for like he was really good for I think what six years probably oh. yeah something like that one moment Ryan I'm getting a I'm getting a call on my phone okay sure and uh, I guess I'll just talk you guys through uh, the terrible terrible nightmare I'm going through trying to get the spreadsheet set up I've no clue why this thing isn't working I've made sort functions thousands of times and. For whatever reason, this thing is just not working for me. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, oh, I I think I figured it out, actually. Here, let me try something. There it is. I found it out, guys. So, okay, this is going to be super nerdy. Ho hopefully, some of you have experience with Excel, so you know what I'm talking about. So, when you're trying to create a sort function, basically, you have three parameters. You have the columns that you want to take from, then the number that the column is supposed to represent, and then like true or false if you wanted descending or descending. So something that I just learned after two years of using sort functions is uh, apparently it's the third like it's the number of columns within the range that you choose, not the overall spreadsheet. So yeah, that's great. I am back. Yes, you are. Okay, so just going through the list, uh, which I finally figured out, I just got into a super nerdy discussion about how this works. So basically, the list now comes down to uh, Kareem, then Kobe, uh, Tim Duncan, Carl Malone, uh, LeBron James, Bob Cousy, Jerry West, Shaq, Michael Jordan, Bob Pettit, and then Oscar Robertson. Yep, so, and then LeBron will probably be higher because he's going to end up... Yeah, like he's going to keep getting more. Yeah, like literally, if he got the first uh, team selection this year, which he's going to, that ties him with Kareem for the most of all time. Yeah, and you know he's that's a player right there, that LeBron James. Yeah, who knows? Maybe he'll be the best ever. Yeah. Oh, one moment. I'm getting another call. Sorry. Oh, jeez. All right. So I guess I'll recap this uh, Suns uh, Hawks game that we kept referencing that we were watching. Uh, it ended up uh, 113 to 112 for the Hawks, so now they have made the terrible decision to move farther away from the best pick in the NBA. So, you know, that's no fun for them. Uh, in terms of uh, best performers, uh, we had Alfred Payton, who actually got triple-double alongside his brilliant hair. And then for the Hawks, uh, not much happened. Uh, Torian Prince got 22 points. Uh, Dennis Schroeder, uh, 21, 6-6. Six and six. And double-double uh, double for uh, one of the seven Plumlee brothers in the NBA. And yeah, that's pretty much it. But I, I got to get going to dinner, to be honest. So I wanted to thank you, Arad, for uh, coming on. It's been a lot of fun. No problem. It was a great time. Yeah. And if you guys enjoyed listening to this podcast, uh, make sure to give us a like or a review on iTunes. It really helps out the podcast. Uh, five stars, please. And yeah, have a good day, you guys.